Volume One of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Section 11. The door stood open as I entered, and found myself in a spacious and goodly hall, wide exceedingly, even as a horse-course, and around it were an hundred chambers with doors of sandal and aloes wood, plated with red gold, and furnished with silver rings by way of knockers. At the head or upper end of the hall I saw forty damsels, sumptuously dressed, and ornamented, and one and all as bright as moons. None could ever tire of gazing upon them, and all so lovely, that the most ascetic devotee, on seeing them, would become their slave and obey their will. When they saw me, the whole bevy came up to me and said, Welcome, and well come, and good cheer to thee, O our Lord. This whole month have we been expecting thee. Praised be Allah, who hath sent us one who is worthy of us, even as we are worthy of him. Then they made me sit down upon a high divan, and said to me, This day thou art our Lord and Master, and we are thy servants and thy handmaids, so order us as thou wilt. And I marveled at their case. Presently one of them arose, and set meat before me, and I ate, and they ate with me, whilst others warmed water, and washed my hands and feet, and changed my clothes, and others made ready sherbets, and gave us to drink and all gathered around me, being full of joy and gladness at my coming. Then they sat down and conversed with me till nightfall, when five of them arose and laid the trays and spread them with flowers and fragrant herbs and fruits, fresh and dried, and confections in profusion. At last they brought out a fine wine service with rich old wine, and we sat down to drink, and some sang songs, and others played the lute and psaltery, and recorders and other instruments, and the bowl went merrily around. Hereupon such gladness possessed me that I forgot the sorrows of the world one and all, and said, This is indeed life, O oh, sad that tis fleeting! I enjoyed their company till the time came for rest, and our heads were all warm with wine when they said, O oh, our Lord, choose from amongst us her who shall be thy bedfellow this night, and not lie with thee again till forty days be past. So I chose a girl, fair of face and perfect in shape, with eyes coal-edged by nature's hand, hair long and jet black with slightly parted teeth and joining brows. T'was as if she were some limber, graceful branchlet, or the slender stalk of sweet basil, to amaze and to bewilder men's fancy, even as the poet said of such a one. To even her with greeny bow were vain, fool he who finds her beauties in the row. When hath the row those lively lovely limbs, or honey-dews those lips alone bestow? Those eyne, soul-piercing eyne, which slay with love, which bind the victim by their shafts laid low. My heart to second childhood they beguiled. No wonder, love-sick man again is child. And I repeated to her the Maker's words, who said, None other charms but thine shall greet mine eyes, nor other image can my heart surprise. Thy love, my lady, captives all my thoughts, and on that love I'll die and I'll arise. So I lay with her that night, None fairer I ever knew, and when it was morning, the damsels carried me to the hammam bath, and bathed me and robed me in fairest apparel. Then they served up food, and we ate and drank, and the cup went round till nightfall, when I chose from among them one fair of form and face, soft-sided and a model of grace, such an one as the poet described when he said, On her fair bosom caskets twain I scanned. Sealed fast with musk seals lovers to withstand. With arrowy glances stand on guard her eyes, Whose shafts would shoot who dares put forth a hand. With her I spent a most goodly night, And to be brief, O oh my mistress, I remained with them in all solace and delight of life, Eating and drinking, conversing and carousing, And every night lying with one or other of them. But at the head of the new year they came to me in tears and bade me farewell, weeping and crying out and clinging about me, whereat I wondered and said, What may be the matter? Verily you break my heart. They exclaimed, Would heaven we had never known thee, for though we have companies with many, 
yet never saw we a pleasanter than thou or a more courteous and they wept again but tell me more clearly asked i what causeth this weeping which maketh my gallbladder like to burst and they answered o oh, our lord and master it is severance which maketh us weep and thou and thou only art the cause of our tears if thou hearken to us we need never be parted and if thou hearken not we part for ever but our hearts tell us that thou wilt not listen to our words and this is the cause of our tears and cries tell me how the case standeth know o our lord that we are the daughters of kings who have met here and have lived together for years and once in every year we are perforce absent for forty days and afterwards we return and abide here for the rest of the twelve month eating and drinking and taking our pleasure and enjoying delights we are about to depart according to our custom and we fear lest after we be gone thou contrary our charge and disobey our injunctions here now we commit to thee the keys of the palace which containeth forty chambers and thou mayest open of these thirty and nine but beware and we conjure thee by allah and by the lives of us lest thou open the fortieth door for therein is that which shall separate us for ever quoth i assuredly i will not open it if it contain the cause of severance from you then one among them came up to me and falling on my neck wept and recited these verses if time unite us after absent while the world harsh frowning on our lot shall smile and if thy semblance deign adorn mine eyes i'll pardon time past wrongs and bygone guile and i recited the following when drew she near to bid adieu with heart unstrung while care and longing on that day her bosom wrung wet pearls she wept and mine like red carnelians rolled and joined in sad riviere around her neck they hung when i saw her weeping i said by allah i will never open that fortieth door never and no wise and i bade her farewell thereupon all departed flying away like birds signalling with their hands farewells as they went and leaving me alone in the palace when evening drew near i opened the door of the first chamber and entering it found myself in a place like one of the pleasances of paradise it was a garden with trees of freshest green and ripe fruits of yellow sheen and its birds were singing clear and keen and rills ran wimpling through the fair terrene the sight and sounds brought solace to my sprite and i walked among the trees and i smelt the breath of the flowers on the breeze and heard the birdies sing their melodies hymning the one the almighty in sweetest litanies and i looked upon the apple whose hue is parcel red and parcel yellow as said the poet apple whose hue combines in union mellow my fair's red cheek her hapless lover's yellow then i looked upon the quince and inhaled its fragrance which to shame musk and ambergris even as the poet hath said quince every taste conjoins in her are found gifts which for queen of fruits the quince hath crowned her taste is wine her scent the waft of musk pure gold her hue her shape the moon's fair round then i looked upon the pear whose taste surpasseth sherbet and sugar and the apricot whose beauty striketh the eye with admiration as if she were a polished ruby then i went out of the place and locked the door as it was before when it was the morrow i opened the second door and entering found myself in a spacious plain set with tall date palms and watered by a running stream whose banks were shrubbed with bushes of rose and jasmine while privet and eglantine ox-eye violet and lily narcissus oregon and the winter gilly flower carpeted the borders and the breath of the breeze swept over these sweet-smelling growths diffusing their delicious odors right and left perfuming the world and filling my soul with delight after taking my pleasure there a while i went from it and having closed the door as it was before opened the third door wherein i saw a high open hall pargetted with party-coloured marbles and pietra dura of price and other precious stones and hung with cages of sandalwood and eaglewood full of birds which made sweet music such as the thousand-voiced and the cushat the merle the turtle-dove and the nubian ring-dove my heart was filled with pleasure thereby my grief was dispelled and i slept in that aviary till dawn then i unlocked the door of the fourth chamber and therein found a grand saloon with forty smaller chambers giving upon it 
All their doors stood open, so I entered and found them full of pearls and jacinths, and barrels and emeralds and corals and carbuncles, and all manner precious gems and jewels, such as tongue of man may not describe. My thought was stunned at the sight, and I said to myself, These be things methinks united which could not be found save in the treasuries of a king of kings, nor could the monarchs of the world have collected the like of these. And my heart dilated, and my sorrows ceased. For, quoth I, now verily am I the monarch of the age, since by Allah's grace this enormous wealth is mine, and I have forty damsels under my hand, nor is there any to claim them save myself. Then I gave not over opening place after place until nine and thirty days were passed, and in that time I had entered every chamber except that one whose door the princesses had charged me not to open. But my thoughts, O my mistress, ever ran on that forbidden fortieth, and Satan urged me to open it for my own undoing, nor had I patience to forbear, albeit there wanted of the trysting time but a single day. So I stood before the chamber aforesaid, and after a moment's hesitation, opened the door which was plated with red gold, and entered. I was met by a perfume whose like I had never before smelt, and so sharp and subtle was the odour, that it made my senses drunken as with a strong wine, and I fell to the ground in a fainting fit which lasted a full hour. When I came to myself I strengthened my heart, and entering, found myself in a chamber whose floor was bespread with saffron and blazing with light from branched candelabra of gold and lamps fed with costly oils, which diffused the scent of musk and ambergris. I saw also two great censers, each big as a mazer bowl, flaming with lime aloes, nad perfume, ambergris, and honeyed scents, and the place was full of their fragrance. Presently, O oh my lady, I espied a noble steed, black as the murks of night when murkiest, standing ready saddled and bridled, and his saddle was of red gold, before two mangers, one of clear crystal wherein was husked sesame, and the other also of crystal containing water of the rose scented with musk. When I saw this I marvelled and said to myself, Doubtless in this animal must be some wondrous mystery. And Satan cousined me, so I led him without the palace and mounted him, but he would not stir from his place. So I hammered his sides with my heels, but he moved not, and then I took the rein-whip, and struck him withal. When he felt the blow, he neighed a neigh with a sound like deafening thunder, and opening a pair of wings, flew up with me in the firmament of heaven far beyond the eyesight of man. After a full hour of flight he descended and alighted on a terrace roof, and shaking me off his back, lashed me on the face with his tail, and gouged out my left eye, causing it to roll along my cheek. Then he flew away. I went down from the terrace, and found myself again amongst the ten one-eyed youths, sitting upon their ten couches with blue covers, and they cried out when they saw me, No welcome to thee, nor aught of good cheer. We all lived of lives the happiest, and we ate and drank of the best. Upon brocades and cloths of gold we took rest, and we slept with our heads on beauty's breast, but we could not await one day to gain the delights of a year. Quoth I, Behold, I have become one like unto you, and now I would have you bring me a tray full of blackness, wherewith to blacken my face, and receive me into your society. No, by Allah, quoth they, thou shalt not sojourn with us, and now get thee hence. So they drove me away. Finding them reject me thus, I foresaw that matters would go hard with me, and I remembered the many miseries which destiny had written upon my forehead, and I fared forth from among them, heavy-hearted and tearful-eyed repeating to myself these words. I was sitting at mine ease, but my forwardness brought me to unease. Then I shaved beard and mustachios and eyebrows, renouncing the world, and wandered in calendar garb about Allah's earth, and the Almighty decreed safety for me till I arrived at Baghdad, which was on the evening of this very night. Here I met these two other calendars, standing bewildered, so I saluted them, saying, I am a stranger, and they answered, And we likewise be strangers. By the freak of fortune we were like to thee, three calendars and three monoculars, all blind of the left eye. Such, O oh my lady, is the cause of the shearing of my beard and the manner of my losing an eye. Said the lady to him, Rub thy head and wend thy ways. But he answered, By Allah, I will not go until I hear the stories of these others. 
Then the lady, turning towards the caliph, and Ja'afar and Masrur, said to them, Do ye also give an account of yourselves, you men? Whereupon Ja'afar stood forth, and told her what he had told the portress, as they were entering the house, and when she heard the story of their being merchants and Mosul men who had outrun the watch, she said, I grant you your lives, each for each sake, and now away with you all. So they all went out, and when they were in the street, quoth the caliph to the calendars, O company, whither go ye now, seeing that the morning hath not yet dawned? Quoth they, By Allah, our Lord, we know not where to go. Come and pass the rest of the night with us, said the caliph, and turning to Ja'afar, take them home with thee, and to-morrow bring them to my presence, that we may chronicle their adventures. Ja'afar did as the caliph bade him, and the commander of the faithful returned to his palace, but sleep gave no sign of visiting him that night, and he lay awake, pondering the mishaps of the three calendar princes, and impatient to know the history of the ladies and the two black bitches. No sooner had morning dawned than he went forth and sat upon the throne of his sovereignty, and turning to Ja'afar, after all his grandees and officers of state were gathered together, he said, Bring me the three ladies and the two bitches and the three calendars. So Ja'afar fared forth and brought them all before him, and the ladies were veiled. Then the minister turned to them and said in the caliph's name, We pardon you your maltreatment of us and your want of courtesy, in consideration of the kindness which forewent it, and for that ye knew us not. Now, however, I would have you to know that ye stand in the presence of the fifth of the sons of Abbas, Harun al-Rashid, brother of Caliph Musa al-Hadi, son of al-Mansur, son of Mohammed, the brother of al-Safa bin Mohammed, who was the first of the royal house. Speak ye therefore before him the truth and the whole truth. When the ladies heard Ja'afar's words touching the commander of the faithful, the eldest came forward and said, O prince of true believers, my story is one which, were it graven with needle-gravers upon the eye-corners, were a warner for whoso would be warned, and an example for whoso can take profit from example. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seventeenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that she stood forth before the commander of the faithful, and began to tell the eldest lady's tale. Verily, a strange tale is mine, and tis this. Yon two black bitches are my eldest sisters by one mother and father, and these two others, she who beareth upon her the signs of stripes, and the third, our procuratrix, are my sisters by another mother. When my father died, each took her share of the heritage, and after a while my mother also deceased, leaving me and my sisters German three thousand dinars. So each daughter received her portion of a thousand dinars, and I the same. I'll be the youngest. In due course of time my sisters married with the usual festivities and lived with their husbands, who bought merchandise with their wives' monies and set out on their travels together. Thus they threw me off. My brothers-in-law were absent with their wives five years, during which period they spent all the money they had and, becoming bankrupt, deserted my sisters in foreign parts amid stranger folk. After five years my eldest sister returned to me in beggar's gear, with her clothes in rags and tatters, and a dirty old mantilla, and truly she was in the foulest and sorriest plight. At first sight I did not know my own sister, but presently I recognized her and said, What state is this? Oh, our sister, she replied, words cannot undo the done, and the reed of destiny hath run through what Allah decreed. Then I sent her to the bath, and dressed her in a suit of mine own, and boiled for her a bouillon, and brought her some good wine, and said to her, O oh, my sister, thou art the eldest, who still standest to us in the stead of father and mother, and as for the inheritance which came to me as to you twain, Allah hath blessed it, and prospered it to me with increase, and my circumstances are easy, for I have made much money by spinning and cleaning silk, and I and you will share my wealth alike. I entreated her with all kindliness, and she abode with me for a whole year, during which our thoughts and fancies were always full of our other sister. Shortly after, she too came home in yet fouler and sorrier plight than that of my eldest sister, and I dealt by her still more honorably than I had done by the first, and each of them had a share of my substance. After a time they said to me, O oh, our sister, we desire to marry again, for indeed we have not patience to drag on our days without husbands and to lead the lives of widows bewitched. And I replied, O eyes of me, 
Ye have hitherto seen scanty weal in wedlock, for nowadays good men and true are become rarities and curiosities. Nor do I deem your projects advisable, as ye have already made trial of matrimony and have failed. But they would not accept my advice, and married without my consent. Nevertheless I gave them outfit and dowries out of my money, and they fared forth with their mates. In a mighty little time their husbands played them false, and taking whatever they could lay hands upon, levanted and left them in the lurch. Thereupon they came to me ashamed, and in abject case, and made their excuses to me, saying, Pardon our fault, and be not wrath with us, for although thou art younger in years, yet art thou older in wit. Henceforth we will never make mention of marriage, so take us back as thy handmaidens, that we may eat our mouthful. Quoth I, Welcome to you, O my sisters, there is naught dearer to me than you. And I took them in, and redoubled my kindness to them. We ceased not to live after this loving fashion for a full year, when I resolved to sell my wares abroad, and first to fit me a conveyance for Bassora. So I equipped a large ship, and loaded her with merchandise and valuable goods for traffic, and with provant and all needful for a voyage, I said to my sisters, Will ye abide at home whilst I travel, or would ye prefer to accompany me on the voyage? We will travel with thee, answered they, for we cannot bear to be parted from thee. So I divided my monies into two parts, one to accompany me, and the other to be left in charge of a trusty person, for as I said to myself, haply some accident may happen to the ship, and yet we remain alive, in which case we shall find on our return what may stand us in good stead. I took my two sisters, and we went a-voyaging some days and nights, but the master was careless enough to miss his course, and the ship went astray with us, and entered a sea other than the sea we sought. For a time we knew naught of this, and the wind blew fair for us ten days, after which the lookout man went aloft to see about him, and cried, Good news! Then he came down rejoicing, and said, I have seen what seemeth to be a city, as t'were a pigeon. Hereat we rejoiced, and ere an hour of the day had passed, the building showed plain in the offing, and we asked the captain, What is the name of yonder city? And he answered, By Allah I know it not, for I never saw it before, and never sailed these seas in my life. But since our troubles have ended in safety, remains for you only to land there with your merchandise, and if you find selling profitable, sell and make your market of what it is there. And if not, we will rest here two days, and provision ourselves, and fare away. So we entered the port, and the captain went up town, and was absent a while. After which he returned to us, and said, Arise, go up into the city, and marvel at the works of Allah with his creatures, and pray to be preserved from his righteous wrath. So we landed, and going up into the city, saw at the gate men holding staves in hand. But when we drew near them, behold, they had been translated by the anger of Allah, and had become stones. Then we entered the city, and found all therein turned into black stones and stoned. Not an inhabited house appeared to the aspire, nor was there a blower of fire. We were awestruck at the sight, and threaded the market streets, where we found the goods and gold and silver left lying in their places, and we were glad, and said, Doubtless there is some mystery in all this. Then we dispersed about the thoroughfares, and each busied himself with collecting the wealth and money and rich stuffs, taking scanty heed of friend or comrade. As for myself, I went up to the castle which was strongly fortified, and entering the king's palace by its gate of red gold, found all the vaisselle of gold and silver, and the king himself seated in the midst of his chamberlains and nabobs and emirs and wazirs, all clad in raiment which confounded man's art. I drew nearer, and saw him sitting on a throne encrusted and inlaid with pearls and gems, and his robes were of gold cloth adorned with jewels of every kind, each one flashing like a star. Around him stood fifty mamelukes, white slaves, clothed in silks of diverse sorts, holding their drawn swords in their hands, but when I drew near to them, lo, all were black stones. My understanding was confounded at the sight, but I walked on and entered the great hall of the harem, whose walls I found hung with tapestries of gold, striped silk, and spread with silken carpets embroidered with golden cowers. Here I saw the queen lying at full length, arrayed in robes with fresh young pearls. On her head was a diadem set with many sorts of gems, each fit for a ring, and around her neck hung collars and necklaces. All her raiment and her ornaments were in natural state, but she had been turned into a black stone by Allah's wrath. Presently I espied an open door for which I made straight, and found, leading to it, a flight of seven steps. So I walked up, and came upon a place pargetted with marble, 
and spread and hung with gold-worked carpets and tapestry, a middlemost of which stood a throne of juniper wood inlaid with pearls and precious stones and set with the bosses of emeralds. In the further wall was an alcove whose curtains, bestrung with pearls, were let down, and I saw a light issuing therefrom. So I drew near, and perceived that the light came from a precious stone as big as an ostrich egg, set at the upper end of the alcove upon a little chryselephantine couch of ivory and gold, and this jewel, blazing like the sun, cast its rays wide and side. The couch also was spread with all manner of silken stuffs, amazing the gazer with their richness and beauty. I marvelled much at all this, especially when seeing in that place candles ready lighted, and I said in my mind, Needs must some one have lighted these candles. Then I went forth and came to the kitchen, and thence to the buttery and the king's treasure chambers, and continued to explore the palace and to pace from place to place. I forgot myself in my awe and marvel at these matters, and I was drowned in thought till the night came on. Then I would have gone forth, but knowing not the gate I lost my way. So I returned to the alcove whither the lighted candles directed me, and sat down upon the couch, and wrapping myself in a coverlet after I had repeated somewhat from the Koran, I would have slept, but could not, for a restlessness possessed me. When night was at its noon I heard a voice chanting the Koran in sweetest accents, but the tone thereof was weak. So I rose, glad to hear the silence broken, until I reached a closet whose door stood ajar. Then, peeping through a chink, I considered the place, and, lo, it was an oratory wherein was a prayer niche, with two wax candles burning and lamps hanging from the ceiling. In it, too, was spread a prayer carpet, whereupon sat a youth fair to see, and before him on its stand was a copy of the Koran, from which he was reading. I marveled to see him alone, alive amongst the people of the city, and entering saluted him, whereupon he raised his eyes and returned my salam. Quoth I, now by the truth of what thou readest in Allah's holy book, I conjure thee to answer my question. He looked upon me with a smile, and said, O handmaid of Allah, first tell me the cause of thy coming hither, and I in turn will tell what hath befallen both me and the people of this city, and what was the reason of my escaping their doom. So I told him my story, whereat he wondered, and I questioned him of the people of the city, when he replied, Have patience with me for a while, O my sister and reverently closing the holy book, he laid it up in a satin bag. Then he seated me by his side, and I looked at him, and, behold, he was as the moon at its full, fair of face and rare of form, soft-sided and slight, of well-proportioned height, and cheek smoothly bright and diffusing light, in brief a sweet a sugar stick, even as saith the poet of the like of him in these couplets. That night the astrologer a scheme of planets drew, and, lo, a graceful shape of youth appeared in view. Saturn had stained his locks with Saturninus jet, and spots of nut-brown musk on rosy side face blue. Mars tinctured either cheek with tinct of martial red, sagittal shots from eyelid Sagittarius through, dowered from Mercury with bright mercurial wit, bore off the bear what all man's evil glances grew. Amazed stood Astrophil to the sight the marvel birth, when lauded low the moon at full to bust the earth. And of a truth Allah the Most High had robed him in the raiment of perfect grace, and had purfled and fringed it with a cheek all beauty and loveliness, even as the poet saith of such a one. By his eyelids shedding perfume, and his fine slim waist I swear, by the shooting of his shafts barbed with sorcery passing rare, by the softness of his sides and glances lingering light, and brow of dazzling day-tide ray and night within his hair, by his eyebrows which deny to who look upon them rest, now bidding, now forbidding, ever dealing joy and care, by the rose that decks his cheek and the myrtle of its moss, by jacinth bedded in his lips and pearl his smile lays bare, by his graceful bending neck and the curving of his breast, whose polished surface bear those granados lovely pair, by his heavy hips that quiver as he passeth in his pride, or he resteth with that waist which is slim beyond compare, by the satin of his skin, by that fine unsullied sprite, by the beauty that containeth all things bright and debonair, by that ever-open hand, by the candor of his tongue, by noble blood and high degree whereof he's hope and heir. Musk from him borrows muskiness she loveth to exhale, and all the air of ambergris through him perfume the air, 
The sun, methinks, the broad bright sun, before my love would pale, And sans his splendour would appear a paring of his nail. I glanced at him with one glance of eyes, which caused me a thousand sighs, And my heart was at once taken captive wise, so I asked him, O oh, my lord and my love, tell me what whereof I question thee. And he answered, Hearing is obeying. Know, O handmaid of Allah, that this city was the capital of my father, who is the king thou sawest on the throne, transfigured by Allah's wrath to a black stone, and the queen thou foundest in the alcove is my mother. They and all the people of the city were Magians, whom fire adored in lieu of the omnipotent Lord, and were wont to swear by low and heat and shade and light and the spheres revolving day and night. My father had ne'er a son till he was blessed with me near the last of his days, and he reared me till I grew up, and prosperity anticipated me in all things. Now it so fortuned that there was with us an old woman well stricken in years, a Muslimah who, inwardly believing in Allah and his apostle, conformed outwardly with the religion of my people, and my father placed through confidence in her, for that he knew her to be trustworthy and virtuous. And he treated her with ever-increasing kindness, believing her to be of his own belief. So when I was well nigh grown up, my father committed me to her charge, saying, Take him, and educate him, and teach him the rules of our faith. Let him have the best instructions, and cease not thy fostering care of him. So she took me, and taught me the tenets of al-Islam, with the divine ordinances of the wuzu ablution, and the five daily prayers, and she made me learn the Koran by rote, often repeating, Serve none save Allah Almighty. When I had mastered this much of knowledge, she said to me, O oh, my son, keep this matter concealed from thy sire, and reveal not to him, lest he slay thee. So I hid it from him, and I abode on this wise for a term of days, when the old woman died, and the people of the city redoubled in their impiety, and arrogance, and the error of their ways. One day, while they were as wont, behold, they heard a loud and terrible sound, and a crier crying out with a voice like roaring thunder, so every ear could hear, far and near. O folk of this city, leave ye your fire-worshipping, and adore Allah the all-compassionate King. At this fear and terror fell upon the citizens, and they crowded to my father, he being the king of the city, and asked him, What is this awesome voice we have heard, for it hath confounded us with the excess of its terror? And he answered, Let not a voice fright you, nor shake your steadfast sprite, nor turn your back from the faith which is right. Their hearts inclined to his words, and they ceased not to worship the fire, and they persisted in rebellion for a full year from the time they heard the first voice, and on the anniversary came a second cry, and a third at the head of the third year, each year once. Still they persisted in their malpractices, till one day at break of dawn judgment and the wrath of heaven descended upon them with all suddenness, and by the visitation of Allah all were metamorphosed into black stones, they and their beasts and their cattle, and none were saved save myself, who at the time was engaged in my devotions. From that day to this I am in the case thou seest, constant in prayer, and fasting, and reading, and reciting the Koran. But I am indeed grown weary by reason of my loneliness, having none to bear me company. Then said I to him, for in very sooth he had won my heart, and was the lord of my life and soul, O youth! Wilt thou fare with me to Baghdad city, and visit the ulema, and men learned in the law, and doctors of divinity, and get the increase of wisdom, and understanding, and theology? And know that she who standeth in thy presence will be thy handmaid, albeit she be head of her family, and mistress over men, and eunuchs, and servants, and slaves. Indeed my life was no life before it fell in with thy youth. I have here a ship laden with merchandise, and in very truth destiny drove me to this city, that I might come to the knowledge of these matters, for it was fated that we should meet. And I ceased not to persuade him, and speak him fair, and use every art, till he consented. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 11 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on November twentieth, two 2007The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1, Section 12. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1, translated by Richard Burton. Section 12 When it was the eighteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the lady ceased not persuading with soft speech the youth to depart with her till he consented and said yes. She slept that night lying at his feet, and hardly knowing where she was for excess of joy. As soon as the next morning dawned, she pursued, addressing the caliph, I arose, and we entered the treasuries, and took thence whatever was light in weight and great in worth. Then we went down side by side from the castle to the city, where we were met by the captain and my sisters and slaves, who had been seeking for me. When they saw me, they rejoiced, and asked what had stayed me, and I told them all I had seen, and related to them the story of the young prince, and the transformation wherewith the citizens had been justly visited. Hereat all marvelled, but when my two sisters, these two bitches, O commander of the faithful, saw me by the side of my young lover, they jaloused me on his account, and were wroth, and plotted mischief against me. We awaited a fair wind, and went on board rejoicing, and ready to fly for joy, by reasons of the goods we had gotten. But my own greatest joyance was in the youth, and we waited a while till the wind blew fair for us, and then we set sail, and fared forth. Now, as we sat talking, my sisters asked me, And what wilt thou do with this handsome young man? And I answered, I purpose to make him my husband. Then I turned to him, and said, O oh, my lord, I have that to propose to thee, wherein thou must not cross me. And this it is, that when we reach Baghdad, my native city, I offer thee my life as thy handmaiden in holy matrimony, and thou shalt be to me barren, and I will be femme to thee. He answered, I hear, and I obey. Thou art my lady and my mistress, and whatso thou doest I will not gainsay. Then I turned to my sisters, and said, This is my gain, I content me with this youth, and those who have gotten aught of my property, let them keep it as their gain, with my good will. Thou sayest and doest well, answered the twain, but they imagined mischief against me. We ceased not spooning before a fair wind, till we had exchanged the sea of peril for the seas of safety, and in a few days we made Basora city, whose buildings loomed clear before us as evening fell. But after we had retired to rest and were sound asleep, my two sisters arose and took me up, bed and all, and threw me into the sea. They did the same with the young prince, who, as he could not swim, sank and was drowned, and Allah enrolled him in the noble army of martyrs. As for me, would heaven I had been drowned with him, but Allah deemed that I should be of the saved. So when I awoke and found myself in the sea, and saw the ship making off like a dash of lightning, he threw in my way a piece of timber which I bestrided, and the waves tossed me to and fro, till they cast me upon an island coast, a high land and an uninhabited. I landed and walked about the island the rest of the night, and when the morning dawned, I saw a rough track, barely fit for a child of Adam to tread, leading to what proved a shallow ford connecting island and mainland. As soon as the sun had risen, I spread my garments to dry in its rays, and ate of the fruits of the island, and drank of its waters. Then I set out along the foot-track, and ceased not walking, till I reached the mainland. Now, when there remained between me and the city but a two hours' journey, behold, a great serpent, the bigness of a date-palm, came fleeing towards me in all haste, gliding along, now to the right, then to the left, till she was close upon me, whilst her tongue lolled groundwards a span long, and swept the dust as she went. She was pursued by a dragon, who was not longer than two lances, and of slender build, about the bulk of a spear, and, although her terror lent her speed, and she kept wriggling from side to side, he overtook her, and seized her by the tail, 
whereat her tears streamed down, and her tongue was thrust out in her agony. I took pity on her, and picking up a stone, and calling upon Allah for aid, threw it at the dragon's head with such force that he died then and there, and the serpent, opening a pair of wings, flew into the lift, and disappeared from before my eyes. I sat down marvelling over that adventure, but I was weary, and drowsiness overcoming me, I slept where I was for a while. When I awoke, I found a jet-black damsel sitting at my feet shampooing them, and by her side stood two black bitches. My sisters, O commander of the faithful! I was ashamed before her, and sitting up, asked her, O my sister, who and what art thou? And she answered, How soon hast thou forgotten me? I am she for whom thou wroughtest a good deed, and sowedest the seed of gratitude, and slewest her foe. For I am the serpent whom by Allah's aidance thou didst just now deliver from the dragon. I am a jinniya, and he was a jinn who hated me, and none saved my life from him save thou. As soon as thou freedest me from him, I flew on the wind to the ship whence thy sisters threw thee, and removed all that was therein to thy house. Then I ordered my attendant Marids to sink the ship, and I transformed thy two sisters into these black bitches, for I know all that hath passed between them and thee. But as for the youth, of a truth he is drowned. So saying, she flew up with me and the bitches, and presently set us down on the terrace roof of my house, wherein I found ready stored the whole of what property was in my ship, nor was aught of it missing. Now, continued the serpent that was, I swear by all engraver on the seal-ring of Solomon, with whom be peace, unless thou deal to each of these bitches three hundred stripes every day, I will come and imprison thee for ever under the earth. I answered, Hearkening and obedience, and away she flew. But before going she again charged me, saying, I again swear by him who made the two seas flow, and this be my second oath, if thou gainsay me, I will come and transform thee like thy sisters. Since then I have never failed, O commander of the faithful, to beat them with that number of blows, till their blood flows with my tears, I pitying them the while, and well they wot that their being scourged is no fault of mine, and they accept my excuses. And this is my tale and my history. The caliph marvelled at her adventures, and then signed to Ja'afar, who said to the second lady, the portress, And thou, how camest thou by the welts and wheels upon thy body? So she began the tale of the portress. Know, O commander of the faithful, that I had a father, who, after fulfilling his time, deceased and left me a great store of wealth. I remained single for a short time, and presently married one of the richest of his day. I abode with him a year, when he also died, and my share of his property amounted to eighty thousand dinars in gold, according to the holy law of inheritance. Thus I became passing rich, and my reputation spread far and wide, for I had made me ten changes of raiment, each worth a thousand dinars. One day, as I was sitting at home, behold, there came into me an old woman with lantern jaws, and cheeks sucked in, and eyes rucked up, and eyebrows scant and scald, and head bare and bald, and teeth broken by time and mauled, and back bending, and neck nape nodding, and face blotched, and room running, and hair like a snake, black and white speckled, in complexion of very fright even as saith the poet of the like of her, Ill-omened hag, unshriven be her sins, nor mercy visit her on dying bed. Thousand heads, strongest he-mules, would her guiles, despite their bolting, lead with spider thread. And as saith another, a hag to whom the unlawful lawfulest, and witchcraft wisdom in her sight are grown. A mischief-making brat, a demon maid, a whorish woman, and a pimping crone. When the old woman entered, she salamed to me, and kissing the ground before me, said, I have at home an orphan daughter, and this night are her wedding and her displaying. 
we be poor folks and strangers in this city, knowing none inhabitant, and we are broken-hearted. So do thou earn for thyself a recompense and a reward in heaven, by being present at her displaying, and when the ladies of this city shall hear that thou art to make act of presence, they also will present themselves. So shalt thou comfort her affliction, for she is sore bruised in spirit, and she hath none to look to, save Allah the Most High. Then she wept and kissed my feet, reciting these couplets. Thy presence bringeth us a grace, we own before thy winsome face, and wert thou absent, ne'er an one, could stand instead, or take thy place. So pity got hold on me, and compassion, and I said, Hearing is consenting, and please Allah, I will do somewhat more for her. Nor shall she be shown to her bridegroom, save in my raiment, and ornaments, and jewellery. At this the old woman rejoiced, and bowed her head to my feet, and kissed them, saying, Allah requite thee weal, and comfort thy heart, even as thou hast comforted mine. But, O my lady, do not trouble thyself to do me this service at this hour. Be thou ready by supper-time, when I will come and fetch thee. So saying, she kissed my hand, and went her ways. I set about stringing my pearls, and donning my brocades, and making my toilette, little recking what fortune had in womb for me, when suddenly the old woman stood before me, simpering and smiling, till she showed every tooth-stump, and, quoth she, O oh, my mistress, the city madams have arrived, and when I apprised them that thou promised to be present, they were glad and they are now awaiting thee, and looking eagerly for thy coming, and for the honour of meeting thee. So I threw on my mantilla, and making the old crone walk before me, and my handmaidens behind me, I fared till we came to a street well watered and swept neat, where the winnowing breeze blew cool and sweet. Here we were stopped by a gate arched over with a dome of marble stone, firmly seated on solidest foundation and leading to a palace whose walls from earth rose tall and proud, and whose pinnacle was crowned by the clouds, and over the doorway were writ these couplets. I am the wone where mirth shall ever smile, the home of joyance through my lasting while, and mid my court a fountain jets and flows, nor tears nor trouble shall that fount defile. The merge with royal Nu'uman's bloom is dight, Myrtle, Narcissus flower, and chamomile. Arrived at the gate, before which hung a black curtain, the old woman knocked, and it was opened to us. When we entered, and found a vestibule spread with carpets, and hung around with lamps all alight, and wax candles in candelabra adorned with pendants of precious gems and noble oars. We passed on through this passage, till we entered a saloon, whose like for grandeur and beauty is not to be found in this world. It was hung and carpeted with silken stuffs, and was illuminated with branched sconces and tapers, ranged in double row, an avenue abutting on the upper or noble end of the saloon, where stood a couch of juniper wood encrusted with pearls and gems, and surmounted by a baldachin with mosquito curtains of satin looped up with margaritas. And hardly had we taken note of this, when there came forth from the baldachin a young lady, and I looked, O commander of the faithful, upon a face and form more perfect than the moon when fullest, with a favour brighter than the dawn, gleaming with saffron-hued light, even as the poet sang when he said, Thou pacest the palace a marvel sight, A bride for Kisra's or Kaiser's night. Wantons the rose on thy roseate cheek, O cheek as the blood of the dragon bright, Slim-waisted, languorous, sleepy-eyed, With charms which promise all love, And the tire which attires thy tiarred brow Is a night of woe on a morn's glad light. The fair young girl came down from the estrade, and said to me, Welcome, and well come, and good cheer to my sister, the dearly beloved, the illustrious, and a thousand greetings. Then she recited these couplets. And but the house could know who cometh, t'would rejoice, and kiss the very dust whereon thy foot was placed, and with the tongue of circumstance the walls would say, 
welcome and hail to one with generous gifts engraced. Then sat she down and said to me, O my sister, I have a brother who hath had sight of thee at sundry wedding feasts and festive seasons. He is a youth handsomer than I, and he hath fallen desperately in love with thee, for that bounteous destiny hath garnered in thee all beauty and perfection, and he hath given silver to this old woman that she might visit thee, and she hath contrived on this wise to foregather us twain. He hath heard that thou art one of the nobles of thy tribe, nor is he aught less in his, and, being desirous to ally his lot with thy lot, he hath practised this device to bring me in company with thee, for he is fain to marry thee after the ordinance of Allah and his apostle. And in what is lawful and right there is no shame. When I heard these words, and saw myself fairly entrapped in the house, I said, Hearing is consenting. She was delighted at this, and clapped her hands, whereupon a door opened, and out of it came a young man, blooming in the prime of life, exquisitely dressed, a model of beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace, with gentle winning manners, and eyebrows like a bended bow and shaft on cord, and eyes which bewitched all hearts with sorcery lawful in the sight of the Lord, even as saith some rhymer describing the like of him. His face as the face of the young moon shines, and fortune stamps him with pearls for signs. And Allah favour him who said, Blessed be his beauty, blessed the Lord's decree, who cast and shaped a thing so bright of blee. All gifts of beauty he conjoins in one, lost in his love is all humanity. For beauty's self inscribed on his brow, I testify there be no good but he. When I looked at him, my heart inclined to him and loved him. And he sat by my side and talked with me a while, when the young lady again clapped her hands, and behold, a side door opened, and out of it came the Kazi with his four assessors as witnesses. And they saluted us, and sitting down, drew up and wrote out the marriage contract between me and the youth, and retired. Then he turned to me and said, Be our knight blessed, presently adding, O my lady, I have a condition to lay on thee. Quoth I, O my lord, what is that? Whereupon he arose, and fetching a copy of the holy book, presented it to me, saying, Swear hereon thou wilt never look at any other than myself, nor incline thy body or thy heart to him. I swore readily enough to this, and he joyed with exceeding joy, and embraced me round the neck, while love for him possessed my whole heart. Then they set the table before us, and we ate and drank till we were satisfied, but I was dying for the coming of the night. And when night did come, he led me to the bride-chamber, and slept with me on the bed, and continued to kiss and embrace me till the morning, such a night I had never seen in my dreams. I lived with him a life of happiness and delight for a full month at the end of which I asked his leave to go on foot to the bazaar, and buy me certain especial stuffs, and he gave me permission. So I donned my mantilla, and taking with me the old woman and a slave-girl, I went to the khan of the silk-mercers, where I seated myself in the shop-front of a young merchant, whom the old woman recommended, saying to me, This youth's father died when he was a boy, and left him a great store of wealth. He hath by him a mighty fine stock of goods, and thou wilt find what thou seekest with him, for none in the bazaar hath better stuffs than he. Then she said to him, Show this lady the most costly stuffs thou hast by thee. And he replied, Hearkening and obedience. Then she whispered me, Say a civil word to him. But I replied, I am pledged to address no man save my lord, and as she began to sound his praise, I said sharply to her, We want naught of thy sweet speeches. Our wish is to buy of him whatsoever we need, and return home. So he brought me all I sought, and I offered him his money. But he refused to take it, saying, Let it be a gift offered to my guest this day. Then quoth I to the old woman, If he will not take the money, give him back his stuff. By Allah, cried he, not a thing will I take from thee, 
I sell it not for gold or silver, but I give it all as a gift for a single kiss, a kiss more precious to me than everything the shop containeth. Asked the old woman, What will the kiss profit thee? And turning to me, whispered, O oh, my daughter, thou hearest what this young fellow saith? What harm will it do thee, if he get a kiss from thee, and thou gettest what thou seekest at that price? Replied I, I take refuge with Allah from such action. Knowest thou not that I am bound by an oath? And she answered, Now whist, just let him kiss thee, and neither speak to him nor lean over him, so shalt thou keep thine oath and thy silver, and no harm whatever shall befall thee. And she ceased not to persuade me, and importune me, and make light of the matter, till evil entered into my mind, and I put my head in the poke, and declaring I would ne'er consent, consented. So I veiled my eyes, and held up the edge of my mantilla between me and the people passing, and he put his mouth to my cheek under the veil. But while kissing me he bit me so hard a bite, that it tore the flesh from my cheek, and blood flowed fast, and faintness came over me. The old woman caught me in her arms, and when I came to myself, I found the shop shut, and her sorrowing over me, and saying, Thank Allah for averting what might have been worse. Then she said to me, Come, take heart, and let us go home before the matter become public, and thou be dishonoured. And when thou art safe inside the house, feign sickness, and lie down, and cover thyself up, and I will bring thee powders and plasters to cure this bite withal, and thy wound will be healed at the latest in three days. So, after a while, I arose, and I was in extreme distress, and terror came full upon me, but I went on little by little, till I reached the house, when I pleaded illness, and lay me down. When it was night, my husband came in to me, and said, What hath befallen thee, O my darling, in this excursion of thine? And I replied, I am not well, my head acheth badly. Then he lighted a candle, and drew near me, and looked hard at me, and asked, What is that wound I see on thy cheek, and in the tenderest part, too? And I answered, When I went out to-day with thy leave to buy stuffs, a camel laden with firewood jostled me, and one of the pieces tore my veil, and wounded my cheek as thou seest, for indeed the ways of this city are straight. "'Tomorrow,' cried he, "'I will go complain to the governor, "'so shall he gibbet every fuel-seller in Baghdad.' "'Allah upon thee,' said I, "'burden not thy soul with such a sin against any man. "'The fact is, I was riding on an ass, "'and it stumbled, throwing me to the ground, "'and my cheek lighted upon a stick or a bit of glass, "'and got this wound. "'Then,' said he, "'tomorrow I will go up to Ja'afar the Barmaki, and tell him the story, so shall he kill every donkey-boy in Baghdad. Wouldst thou destroy all these men because of my wound? said I, when this which befell me was by the decree of Allah and his destiny. But he answered, There is no help for it, and springing to his feet, plied me with words, and pressed me till I was perplexed and frightened, and I stuttered and stammered, and my speech waxed thick, and I said, this is a mere accident by decree of Allah. Then, O commander of the faithful, he guessed my case, and said, Thou hast been false to thine oath. He at once cried out with a loud cry, whereupon a door opened, and in came seven black slaves, whom he commanded to drag me from my bed, and throw me down in the middle of the room. Furthermore, he ordered one of them to pinion my elbows and squat upon my head, and a second to sit upon my knees and secure my feet. And drawing his sword, he gave it to a third, and said, Strike her, O Sa'ad, and cut her in twain, and let each one take half, and cast it into the tigris, that the fish may eat her, for such is the retribution due to those who violate their vows, and are unfaithful to their love and he redoubled in wrath, and recited these couplets. An there be one who shares with me her love, I'd strangle love, though life by love were slain, saying, O soul, death were the nobler choice, for ill is love when shared twixt partners twain. Then he repeated to the slave, 
Smite her, O Sa'ad! And when the slave who was sitting upon me made sure of the command, he bent down to me and said, O my mistress, repeat the profession of faith, and bethink thee if there be anything thou wouldst have done, for verily this is the last hour of thy life. O good slave, said I, wait but a little while, and get off my head, that I may charge thee with my last injunctions. Then I raised my head, and saw the state I was in, how I had fallen from high degree into lowest disgrace, and into death after life, and such life, and how I had brought my punishment on myself by my own sin. Whereupon the tears streamed from mine eyes, and I wept with exceeding weeping. But he looked on me with eyes of wrath, and began repeating, Tell her who turneth from our love to work it injury sore, and taketh her a fine new love, the old love tossing o'er. We cry enough of thee, ere thou enough of us shalt cry. What passed between us doth suffice, and haply something more. When I heard this, O commander of the faithful, I wept and looked at him, and began repeating these couplets. To severance you doom my love, and all unmoved remain. My tear-sore lids you sleepless make, and sleep while I complain. You make firm friendship reign between mine eyes and insomny. Yet can my heart forget you not, nor tears can I restrain. You made me swear with many an oath my troth to hold for I, But when you reigned my bosom's lord, you wrought me traitor bane. I loved you like a silly child who wots not what is love. Then spare the learner, let her not be by the master slain. By Allah's name, I pray you write, when I am dead and gone, Upon my tomb, this died of love, whose senses love had ta'en. Then haply one shall pass that way, who far of love hath felt, And treading on a lover's heart, with ruth and woe shall melt. When I ended my verses, tears came again, But the poetry and the weeping only added fury to his fury, And he recited, T'was not satiety bade me leave the darling of my soul, But that she sinned a mortal sin which clips me in its clip. She sought to let another share the love between us twain, But my true faith of unity refuseth partnership. When he ceased reciting, I wept again, And prayed his pardon, and humbled myself before him, And spoke him softly, saying to myself, I will work on him with words, so haply he will refrain from slaying me, even though he take all I have. So I complained of my sufferings, and began to repeat these couplets. Now by thy life, and wert thou just, my life thou hadst not ta'en, but who can break the severance law which parteth lovers twain? Thou loadest me with heavy weight of longing love, When I can hardly bear my chemisette For weakness and for pain. I marvel not to see my life and soul in ruin lane, I marvel much to see my frame Such severance pangs sustain. When I ended my verse, I wept again, And he looked at me and reviled me in abusive language, Repeating these couplets. Thou wast all taken up with love of other man, not me. T'was thine to show me severance face, T'was only mine to see. I'll leave thee, for that first thou wert of me to take thy leave, And patient bear that parting blow thou borest so patiently. E'en as thou soughtest other love, so other love I'll seek, And make the crime of murdering love thine own atrocity. When he had ended his verses, he again cried out to the slave, Cut her in half, and free us from her, for we have no profit of her. So the slave drew near me, O commander of the faithful, and I ceased bandying verses, and made sure of death, and despairing of life, committed my affairs to Almighty Allah. When, behold, the old woman rushed in, and threw herself at my husband's feet, and kissed them, and wept, and said, O my son! By the rights of my fosterage, and by my long service to thee, I conjure thee, pardon this young lady, For indeed she hath done nothing deserving such doom. Thou art a very young man, And I fear lest her death be laid at thy door, For it is said, 
whoso slayeth shall be slain. As for this wanton, since thou deemest her such, drive her out from thy doors, from thy love and from thy heart. And she ceased not to weep and importune him, till he relented and said, I pardon her, but needs must I set on her my mark, which shall show upon her all my life. Then he bade the slaves drag me along the ground, and lay me out at full length, after stripping me of all my clothes. And when the slaves had so sat upon me that I could not move, he fetched in a rod of quince tree, and came down with it upon my body, and continued beating me on the back and sides, till I lost consciousness from excess of pain, and I despaired of life. Then he commanded the slaves to take me away as soon as it was dark, together with the old woman, to show them the way, and throw me upon the floor of the house wherein I dwelt before my marriage. They did their lord's bidding, and cast me down in my old home, and went their ways. I did not revive from my swoon till dawn appeared, when I applied myself to the dressing of my wounds with ointments and other medicaments, and I medicined myself, but my sides and ribs still showed signs of the rod as thou hast seen. I lay in weakly case, and confined to my bed for four months, before I was able to rise, and health returned to me. At the end of that time I went to the house where all this had happened, and found it a ruin. The street had been pulled down end long, and rubbish heaps rose where the building erst was. Nor could I learn how this had come about. Then I betook myself to this my sister, on my father's side, and found her with these two black bitches. I saluted her, and told her what had betided me, and the whole of my story, and she said, O oh, my sister, who is safe from the despite of time, and secure? Thanks be to Allah, who has brought thee off safely. And she began to say, Such is the world, so bear a patient heart, when riches leave thee, and when friends depart. Then she told me her own story, and what had happened to her with her two sisters, and how matters had ended. So we abode together, and the subject of marriage was never on our tongues for all these years. After a while we were joined by our other sister, the Procuratrix, who goeth out every morning, and buyeth all we require for the day and night. And we continued in such condition till this last night. In the morning our sister went out, as usual, to make her market, and then befell us what befell from bringing the porter into the house, and admitting these three calendar men. We entreated them kindly and honourably, and a quarter of the night had not passed, ere three grave and respectable merchants from Mosul joined us and told us their adventures. We sat talking with them, but on one condition, which they violated, whereupon we treated them as sorted with their breach of promise, and made them repeat the account they had given of themselves. They did our bidding, and we forgave their offence. So they departed from us, and this morning we were unexpectedly summoned to thy presence. And such is our story. The Caliph wondered at her words, and bade the tale be recorded and chronicled, and laid up in his muniment chambers. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 12 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1《The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night》Volume 1, Section 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton Volume 1, Section 13 when it was the nineteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph commanded this story, and those of the sister and the calendars, to be recorded in the archives, 
and be set in the royal muniment chambers. Then he asked the eldest lady, the mistress of the house, Knowest thou the whereabouts of the Ifrita who spelled thy sisters? And she answered, O commander of the faithful, she gave me a ringlet of her hair, saying, When as thou wouldest see me, burn a couple of these hairs, and I will be with thee forthright, even though I were beyond Caucasus mountain. Quoth the caliph, Bring me hither the hair. So she brought it, and he threw the whole lock upon the fire. As soon as the odour of the burning hair dispread itself, the palace shook and trembled, and all present heard a rumbling and rolling of thunder, and a noise as of wings, and lo, the jinniyah, who had been a serpent, stood in the caliph's presence. Now she was a Muslimah, so she saluted him, and said, Peace be with thee, O vicar of Allah. Whereto he replied, and with thee also be peace, and the mercy of Allah and his blessing. Then she continued, Know that this damsel sowed for me the seed of kindness, wherefore I cannot enough requite her, in that she delivered me from death and destroyed mine enemy. Now I had seen how her sisters dealt with her, and felt myself bound to avenge her on them. At first I was minded to slay them, but I feared it would be grievous to her, so I transformed them to bitches. But if thou desire their release, O commander of the faithful, I will release them to pleasure thee and her, for I am of the Muslims. Quoth the caliph, Release them, and after we will look into the affair of the beaten lady, and consider her case carefully, and if the truth of her story be evidenced, I will exact retaliation from him who wronged her. Said the Ifrita, O commander of the faithful, I will forthwith release them, and will discover to thee the man who did that deed by this lady, and wronged her, and took her property, and he is the nearest of all men to thee. So saying, she took a cup of water, and muttered a spell over it, and uttered words there was no understanding. Then she sprinkled some of the water over the faces of the two bitches, saying, Return to your former human shape whereupon they were restored to their natural forms, and fell to praising their Creator. Then said the Ifrita, O commander of the faithful, of a truth, he who scourged this lady with rods, is thy son, Alamin, brother of Al-Ma'amun. For he had heard of her beauty and loveliness, and he played a lover's stratagem with her, and married her according to the law, and committed the crime, such as it is, of scourging her. Yet indeed he is not to be blamed for beating her, for he laid a condition on her, and swore her by a solemn oath not to do a certain thing. However, she was false to her vow, and he was minded to put her to death, but he feared Almighty Allah, and contented himself with scourging her, as thou hast seen, and with sending her back to her own place. Such is the story of the second lady, and the Lord knoweth all. When the caliph heard these words of the Ifrita, and knew who had beaten the damsel, he marvelled with mighty marvel, and said, Praise be to Allah the Most High, the Almighty, who hath shown his exceeding mercy towards me, enabling me to deliver these two damsels from sorcery and torture, and vouchsafing to let me know the secret of this lady's history. And now by Allah we will do a deed which shall be recorded of us after we are no more. Then he summoned his son Alamin, and questioned him of the story of the second lady, the portress, and he told it in the face of truth. Whereupon the caliph bade call into presence the Kazis and their witnesses, and the three calendars, and the first lady with her sisters German, who had been ensorcelled, and he married the three to the three calendars, whom he knew to be princes and sons of kings, and he appointed them chamberlains about his person assigning to them stipends and allowances, and all that they required, and lodging them in his palace at Baghdad. He returned the beaten lady to his son Alamin, renewing the marriage contract between them, and gave her great wealth, and bade rebuild the house fairer than it was before. As for himself, he took to wife the procuratrix, and lay with her that night, and next day he set apart for her an apartment in his seraglio, with handmaidens for her service, and a fixed daily allowance. 
and the people marvelled at their caliph's generosity and natural beneficence and princely wisdom. Nor did he forget to send all these histories to be recorded in his annals. When Shahrazad ceased speaking, Dunyazad exclaimed, O oh, my own sister, by Allah, in very sooth, this is a right pleasant tale, and a delectable. Never was heard the like of it. But prithee, tell me now another story to while away what yet remaineth of the waking hours of this our night. She replied, With love and gladness, if the king give me leave. And he said, Tell thy tale, and tell it quickly. So she began in these words. THE TALE OF THE THREE APPLES They relate, O King of the Age, and Lord of the time and of these days, that the Caliph Harun al-Rashid summoned his wazir Ja'afar one night, and said to him, I desire to go down into the city and question the common folk concerning the conduct of those charged with its governance, and those of whom they complain we will depose from office and those whom they commend we will promote. Quoth Ja'afar, hearkening and obedience. So the caliph went down with Ja'afar and the eunuch Masrur to the town, and walked about the streets and markets, and as they were threading a narrow alley, they came upon a very old man, with a fishing net and crate to carry small fish on his head, and in his hand a staff, and as he walked at a leisurely pace, he repeated these lines. They say me, Thou shinest a light to mankind, With thy law as the night which the moon doth uplight. I answer, A truce to your jests and your jibes, Without luck what is learning, a poor devil white. If they take me to pawn with my law in my pouch, With my volumes to read and my ink-case to write, For one day's provision they never could pledge me, as likely on doomsday to draw bill at sight. How poorly indeed doth it fare with a poor, with his pauper existence and beggarly plight. In summer he faileth provision to find, in winter the fire-pots his only delight. The street-dogs with bite and with bark to him rise, and each lozzle receives him with bark and with bite. If he lift up his voice and complain of his wrong, None pities or heeds him, however he's right. And when sorrows and evils like these he must brave, His happiest homestead were down in the grave. When the caliph heard his verses, he said to Ja'afar, See this poor man, and note his verses, For surely they point to his necessities. Then he accosted him, and asked, O oh, Shaykh, what be thine occupation? And the poor man answered, O oh, my lord, I am a fisherman with a family to keep, and I have been out between midday and this time, and not a thing hath Allah made my portion wherewithal to feed my family. I cannot even pawn myself to buy them a supper, and I hate and disgust my life, and I hanker after death. Quoth the Caliph, Say me, wilt thou return with us to Tigris Bank, and cast thy net on my luck, and whatsoever turneth up I will buy of thee for an hundred gold pieces. The man rejoiced when he heard these words, and said, On my head be it, I will go back with you. And returning with them riverwards, made a cast, and waited a while. Then he hauled in the rope, and dragged the net ashore, and there appeared in it a chest padlocked and heavy. The caliph examined it, and lifted it, finding it weighty. So he gave the fisherman two hundred dinars, and sent him about his business, whilst Masrur, aided by the caliph, carried the chest to the palace, and set it down and lighted the candles. Ja'afar and Masrur then broke it open, and found therein a basket of palm-leaves corded with red worsted. This they cut open, and saw within it a piece of carpet which they lifted out, and under it was a woman's mantilla folded in four, which they pulled out, and at the bottom of the chest they came upon a young lady, fair as a silver ingot, slain and cut into nineteen pieces. When the caliph looked upon her, he cried, Alas! and tears ran down his cheeks, and turning to Ja'afar, he said, O dog of wazirs, shall folk be murdered in our reign, and be cast into the river to be a burden and a responsibility for us on the day of doom? 
by Allah, we must avenge this woman on her murderer, and he shall be made die the worst of deaths. And presently he added, Now as surely as we are descended from the sons of Abbas, if thou bring us not him who slew her, that we do her justice on him, I will hang thee at the gate of my palace, thee and forty of thy kith and kin by thy side. And the caliph was wroth with exceeding rage. Quoth Ja'far, Grant me three days' delay. And quoth the caliph, We grant thee this. So Ja'far went from before him, and returned to his own house, full of sorrow, and saying to himself, How shall I find him who murdered this damsel, that I may bring him before the caliph? If I bring other than the murderer, it will be laid to my charge by the Lord. In very sooth I wot not what to do. He kept his house three days, and on the fourth day the caliph sent one of the chamberlains for him, and as he came into the presence asked him, Where is the murderer of the damsel? To which answered Ja'afar, O commander of the faithful, am I inspector of murdered folk, that I should ken who killed her? The caliph was furious at his answer, and bade hang him before the palace gate, and commanded that a crier cry through the streets of Baghdad, Whoso would see the hanging of Ja'far the Barmaki, wazir of the caliph, with forty of the Barmicides, his cousins and kinsmen, before the palace gate, let him come and let him look. The people flocked out from all the quarters of the city to witness the execution of Ja'far and his kinsmen, not knowing the cause. Then they set up the gallows, and made Ja'afar and the others stand underneath, in readiness for execution. But whilst every eye was looking for the caliph's signal, and the crowd wept for Ja'afar and his cousins of the Barmicides, lo and behold, a young man, fair of face and neat of dress, and of favour like the moon raining light, with eyes black and bright, and brow flower white, and cheeks red as rose, and young down where the beard grows, and a mole like a grain of ambergris, pushed his way through the people, till he stood immediately before the wazir, and said to him, Safety to thee from this strait, O prince of the emirs, and asylum of the poor. I am the man who slew the woman ye found in the chest. So hang me for her, and do her justice on me. When Ja'afar heard the youth's confession, he rejoiced at his own deliverance, but grieved and sorrowed for the fair youth. And whilst they were yet talking, behold, another man, well stricken in years, pressed forward through the people, and thrust his way amid the populace, till he came to Ja'afar and the youth, whom he saluted, saying, Ho thou the wazir and prince sans peer, believe not the words of this youth. Of a surety none murdered the damsel but I. Take her reek on me this moment, for, and thou do not thus, I will require it of thee, before almighty Allah. Then quoth the young man, O wazir, this is an old man in his dotage, who wotteth not whatso he saith ever, and I am he who murdered her, so do thou avenge her on me. Quoth the old man, O my son, thou art young, and desirest the joys of the world, and I am old and weary, and surfeited with the world. I will offer my life as a ransom for thee and for the wazir and his cousins. No one murdered the damsel but I, so Allah upon thee, make haste to hang me, for no life is left in me now that hers is gone. The wazir marvelled much at all this strangeness, and taking the young man and the old man, carried them before the caliph, where, after kissing the ground seven times between his hands, he said, O commander of the faithful, I bring thee the murderer of the damsel. Where is he? asked the caliph, and Ja'afar answered, This young man saith, I am the murderer, and this old man, giving him the lie, saith, I am the murderer, and behold, here are the twain standing before thee. The caliph looked at the old man and the young man, and asked, Which of you killed the girl? The young man replied, No one slew her save I. And the old man answered, Indeed, none killed her but myself. Then said the caliph to Ja'afar, Take the twain, and hang them both. But Ja'afar rejoined, 
since one of them was the murderer, to hang the other were mere injustice. "'By him who raised the firmament and dispread the earth like a carpet,' cried the youth, "'I am he who slew the damsel.' And he went on to describe the manner of her murder, and the basket, the mantilla, and the bit of carpet, in fact all that the caliph had found upon her. So the caliph was certified that the young man was the murderer, whereat he wondered, and asked him, what was the cause of thy wrongfully doing this damsel to die, and what made thee confess the murder without the bastinado, and what brought thee here to yield up thy life, and what made thee say, Do her reek upon me? The youth answered, Know, O commander of the faithful, that this woman was my wife, and the mother of my children, also my first cousin, and the daughter of my paternal uncle, this old man, who is my father's own brother. When I married her, she was a maid, and Allah blessed me with three male children by her. She loved me and served me, and I saw no evil in her, for I also loved her with fondest love. Now, on the first day of this month, she fell ill with grievous sickness, and I fetched in physicians to her, but recovery came to her little by little, and when I wished her to go to the hammam bath, she said, there is something I long for before I go to the bath, and I long for it with an exceeding longing. To hear is to comply, said I, and what is it? Quoth she, I have a queasy craving for an apple, to smell it and bite a bit of it. I replied, Hadst thou a thousand longings, I would try to satisfy them. So I went on the instant into the city, and sought for apples, but could find none. Yet, had they cost a gold piece each, would I have bought them? I was vexed at this, and went home and said, O daughter of my uncle, by Allah I can find none. She was distressed, being yet very weakly, and her weakness increased greatly on her that night, and I felt anxious and alarmed on her account. As soon as morning dawned, I went out again, and made the round of the gardens, one by one, but found no apples anywhere. At last there met me an old gardener, of whom I asked about them, and he answered, O oh my son, this fruit is a rarity with us, and is not now to be found save in the garden of the commander of the faithful at Basura, where the gardener keepeth it for the caliph's eating. I returned to my house, troubled by my ill success, and my love for my wife and my affection moved me to undertake the journey. So I got me ready and set out and travelled fifteen days and nights, going and coming, and brought her three apples, which I bought from the gardener for three dinars. But when I went in to my wife and set them before her, she took no pleasure in them, and let them lie by her side, for her weakness and fever had increased on her, and her malady lasted without abating ten days, after which time she began to recover health. So I left my house, and betaking me to my shop, sat there buying and selling, and about midday, behold, a great ugly black slave, long as a lance and broad as a bench, passed by my shop, holding in hand one of the three apples wherewith he was playing. Quoth I, O oh, my good slave, tell me whence thou tookest that apple, that I may get the like of it. He laughed, and answered, I got it from my mistress for I had been absent, and on my return I found her lying ill with three apples by her side, and she said to me, My horned whittle of a husband made a journey for them to Bassora, and bought them for three dinars. So I ate and drank with her, and took this one from her. When I heard such words from the slave, O commander of the faithful, the world grew black before my face, and I arose and locked up my shop, and went home beside myself for excess of rage. I looked for the apples, and finding only two of the three, asked my wife, O oh, my cousin, where is the third apple? And raising her head languidly, she answered, I wot not, O oh, son of my uncle, where tis gone. This convinced me that the slave had spoken the truth, so I took a knife, and coming behind her, got upon her breast without a word said, and cut her throat. Then I hewed off her head and her limbs in pieces, and wrapping her in her mantilla and a rag of carpet, hurriedly sewed up the hole which I set in a chest, and locking it tight, loaded it on my he-mule, and threw it into the tigris with my own hands. 
So Allah upon thee, O commander of the faithful, make haste to hang me, as I fear lest she appeal for vengeance on resurrection day. For when I had thrown her into the river, and none knew aught of it, as I went back home, I found my eldest son crying, and yet he knew naught of what I had done with his mother. I asked him, What hath made thee weep, my boy? And he answered, I took one of the three apples which were by my mammy, and went down into the lane to play with my brethren, when, behold, a big, long, black slave snatched it from my hand, and said, Whence hadst thou this? Quoth I, My father travelled far for it, and brought it from Bassora for my mother, who was ill, and two other apples, for which he paid three ducats. He took no heed of my words, and I asked for the apple a second and a third time, but he cuffed me and kicked me, and went off with it. I was afraid lest my mother should swinge me on account of the apple, so for fear of her I went with my brother outside the city, and stayed there till evening closed in upon us. And indeed I am in fear of her. And now by Allah or my father say nothing to her of this, or it may add to her ailment. When I heard what my child said, I knew that the slave was he who had foully slandered my wife, the daughter of my uncle and was certified that I had slain her wrongfully. So I wept with exceeding weeping, and presently this old man, my paternal uncle and her father, came in, and I told him what had happened, and he sat down by my side and wept, and we ceased not weeping till midnight. We have kept up mourning for her these last five days, and we lamented her in the deepest sorrow, for that she was unjustly done to die. This came from the gratuitous lying of the slave, the blackamoor, and this was the manner of my killing her. So I conjure thee, by the honour of thine ancestors, make haste to kill me, and do her justice upon me, as there is no living for me after her. The caliph marvelled at his words, and said, By Allah, the young man is excusable, I will hang none but the accursed slave and I will do a deed which shall comfort the ill at ease and suffering, and which shall please the all-glorious king. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the twentieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph swore he would hang none but the slave, for the youth was excusable. Then he turned to Ja'afar, and said to him, Bring before me this accursed slave, who was the sole cause of this calamity. And if thou bring him not before me within three days, thou shalt be slain in his stead. So Ja'afar fared forth weeping, and saying, Two deaths have already beset me, nor shall the crock come off safe from every shock. In this matter craft and cunning are of no avail, but he who preserved my life the first time can preserve it a second time. By Allah, I will not leave my house during the three days of life which remain to me, and let the truth, whose perfection be praised, do e'en as he will. So he kept his house three days, and on the fourth day he summoned the Kazis and legal witnesses, and made his last will and testament, and took leave of his children weeping. Presently in came a messenger from the caliph, and said to him, the commander of the faithful is in the most violent rage that can be, and he sendeth to seek thee, and he sweareth that the day shall certainly not pass without thy being hanged, unless the slave be forthcoming. When Ja'afar heard this he wept, and his children and slaves, and all who were in the house, wept with him. After he had bidden adieu to everybody except his youngest daughter, he proceeded to farewell her for he loved this wee one, who was a beautiful child, more than all his other children, and he pressed her to his breast, and kissed her, and wept bitterly at parting from her, when he felt something round inside the bosom of her dress, and asked her, O oh, my little maid, what is in thy bosom pocket? O oh, my father, she replied, it is an apple with the name of our lord the caliph written upon it. Raihan our slave, brought it me four days ago, and would not let me have it, till I gave him two dinars for it. When Ja'afar heard speak of the slave and the apple, he was glad, and put his hand into his child's pocket, and drew out the apple, and knew it, and rejoiced, saying, O ready dispeller of trouble! 
Then he bade them bring the slave, and said to him, Fie upon thee, Raihan! Whence haddest thou this apple? By Allah, O my master, he replied, Though a lie may get a man once off, yet may truth get him off, and well off, again and again. I did not steal this apple from thy palace, nor from the gardens of the commander of the faithful. The fact is that five days ago, as I was walking along one of the alleys of this city, I saw some little ones at play, and this apple in hand of one of them. So I snatched it from him and beat him, and he cried and said, O oh, youth, this apple is my mother's, and she is ill. She told my father how she longed for an apple, so he travelled to Bassora and bought her three apples for three gold pieces, and I took one of them to play with all. He wept again, but I paid no heed to what he said, and carried it off and brought it here, and my little lady bought it of me for two dinars of gold. And this is the whole story. When Ja'afar heard his words, he marvelled that the murder of the damsel and all this misery should have been caused by his slave. He grieved for the relation of the slave to himself, while rejoicing over his own deliverance, and he repeated these lines. If ill betide thee through thy slave, make him forthright thy sacrifice. A many serviles thou shalt find, but life comes once, and never twice. Then he took the slave's hand, and leading him to the caliph, related the story from first to last. And the caliph marvelled with extreme astonishment, and laughed till he fell on his back, and ordered that the story be recorded, and be made public amongst the people. But Ja'afar said, Marvel not, O commander of the faithful, at this adventure, for it is not more wondrous than the history of the wazir Nur ad-Din Ali of Egypt, and his brother Shams ad-Din Muhammad. Quoth the caliph, Out with it, but what can be stranger than this story? And Ja'afar answered, O commander of the faithful, I will not tell it thee, save on condition that thou pardon my slave. And the caliph rejoined, If it be indeed more wondrous than that of the three apples, I grant thee his blood, and if not, I will surely slay thy slave. So Ja'afar began in these words the tale of Nur ad-Din and his son. Know, O commander of the faithful, that in times of yore the land of Egypt was ruled by a sultan endowed with justice and generosity, one who loved the pious poor and companied with the ulama and learned men, and he had a wazir, a wise and an experienced, well versed in affairs and in the art of government. This minister, who was a very old man, had two sons, as they were two moons. Never man saw the like of them for beauty and grace. The elder called Shams ad-Din Muhammad, and the younger Nur ad-Din Ali. But the younger excelled the elder in seemliness and pleasing semblance, so that folk heard his fame in far countries, and men flocked to Egypt for the purpose of seeing him. In course of time their father, the wazir, died, and was deeply regretted and mourned by the sultan, who sent for his two sons, and investing them with dresses of honour, said to them, Let not your hearts be troubled, for ye shall stand in your father's stead, and be joint ministers of Egypt. At this they rejoiced, and kissed the ground before him, and performed the ceremonial mourning for their father during a full month, after which time they entered upon the wazirate, and the power passed into their hands, as it had been in the hands of their father, each doing duty for a week at a time. They lived under the same roof, and their word was one, and whenever the sultan desired to travel, they took it by turns to be in attendance on him. It fortuned one night that the sultan purposed setting out on a journey next morning, and the elder, whose turn it was to accompany him, was sitting conversing with his brother, and said to him, O oh, my brother, it is my wish that we both marry, I and thou, two sisters, and go into our wives on one and the same night. Do, O oh, my brother, as thou desirest, the younger replied, for right is thy wrecking, and surely I will comply with thee in whatso thou sayest. So they agreed upon this, and quoth Shams ad -Din, If Allah decree that we marry two damsels, and go into them on the same night, 
and they shall conceive on their bride nights, and bear children to us on the same day, and by Allah's will thy wife bear thee a son, and my wife bear me a daughter, let us wed them either to other, for they will be cousins. Quoth Nur ad-Din, O my brother Shams ad-Din, what dower wilt thou require from my son for thy daughter? Quoth Shams ad-Din, I will take three thousand dinars, and three pleasure gardens, and three farms. And it would not be seemly that the youth make contract for less than this. When Nur ad-Din heard such demand, he said, What manner of dower is this thou wouldst impose upon my son? Wottest thou not that we are brothers, and both by Allah's grace wazirs and equal in office? It behoveth thee to offer thy daughter to my son without marriage settlement, or, if one need be, it should represent a mere nominal value by way of show to the world, for thou knowest that the masculine is worthier than the feminine, and my son is a male, and our memory will be preserved by him, not by thy daughter. But what, said Shams ad -Din, is she to have? And Nur ad -Din continued, Through her we shall not be remembered among the emirs of the earth. But I see thou wouldest do with me according to the saying, And thou wouldst bluff off a buyer, Ask him a high price and higher. Or, as did a man who, they say, Went to a friend, and asked something of him, Being in necessity, and was answered, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, I will do all what thou requirest, But come to-morrow. Whereupon the other replied in this verse, When he who is asked a favour saith to-morrow, the wise man wots, tis vain to beg or borrow. Quoth Shams ad -Din, Basta! I see thee fail in respect to me, by making thy son of more account than my daughter, and tis plain that thine understanding is of the meanest, and that thou lackest manners. Thou remindest me of thy partnership in the wazirate, when I admitted thee to share with me only in pity for thee, and not wishing to mortify thee, and that thou mightest help me as a manner of assistant. But since thou talkest on this wise, by Allah, I will never marry my daughter to thy son, no, not for her weight in gold. When Nur ad -Din heard his brother's words, he waxed wroth, and said, And I too, I will never, never marry my son to thy daughter, no, not to keep from my lips the cup of death. Shams ad -Din replied, I would not accept him as a husband for her, and he is not worth a paring of her nail. Were I not about to travel, I would make an example of thee. However, when I return, thou shalt see, and I will show thee how I can assert my dignity, and vindicate my honour. But Allah doeth whatso he willeth. When Nur ad-Din heard this speech from his brother, he was filled with fury, and lost his wits for rage. But he hid what he felt, and held his peace. And each of the brothers passed the night in a place far apart, wild with wrath against the other. As soon as morning dawned, the Sultan fared forth in state, and crossed over from Cairo to Giza, and made for the pyramids, accompanied by the wazir Shams ad-Din, whose turn of duty it was. Whilst his brother, Nur ad-Din, who passed the night in sore rage, rose with the light, and prayed the dawn prayer. Then he betook himself to his treasury, and taking a small pair of saddle-bags, filled them with gold. And he called to mind his brother's threats, and the contempt wherewith he had treated him, and he repeated these couplets. Travel, and thou shalt find new friends for old ones left behind, Toil for the sweets of human life, by toil and moil are found. The stay at home no honour wins, nor aught attains but want. So leave thy place of birth, and wander all the world around. I've seen, and very oft I've seen, how standing water stinks, and only flowing sweetens it, and trotting makes it sound. And were the moon for ever full, and ne'er to wax or wane, Man would not strain his watchful eyes to see its gladsome round. Except the lion leave his lair, he ne'er would fell his game, Except the arrow leave the bow, ne'er had it reached its bound. Gold dust is dust, the while it lies untravelled in the mine, And aloes wood mere fuel is upon its native ground. And gold shall win his highest worth, when from his goal ungold, And aloes sent to foreign parts grows costlier than gold. 
When he ended his verse, he bade one of his pages saddle him his Nubian mare-mule with her padded cell. Now she was a dapple grey, with ears like reed-pens, and legs like columns, and a back high and strong as a dome builded on pillars. Her saddle was of gold-cloth, and her stirrups of Indian steel, and her housing of Ispahan velvet. She had trappings which would serve the Khosroes, and she was like a bride adorned for her wedding night. Moreover, he bade lay on her back a piece of silk for a seat, and a prayer carpet under which were his saddle-bags. When this was done, he said to his pages and slaves, I purpose going forth a-pleasuring outside the city, on the road to Kalyub town, and I shall lie three nights abroad. So let none of you follow me, for there is something straighteneth my breast. Then he mounted the mule in haste, and taking with him some provant for the way, set out from Cairo, and faced the open and uncultivated country lying round it. About noontide he entered Bilbay's city, where he dismounted and stayed a while to rest himself and his mule, and ate some of his victual. He bought at Bilbay's all he wanted for himself, and forage for his mule, and then fared on the way of the waste. Towards nightfall he entered a town called Sa'adiya, where he alighted, and took out somewhat of his viaticum, and ate. Then he spread his strip of silk on the sand, and set the saddle-bags under his head, and slept in the open air, for he was still overcome with anger. End of section 13 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1「Hello listeners, this is volume 1 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by Richard Burden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Priya, India. The book of a thousand nights and a night, section 14. When the morning dawned, he mounted and rode onwards till he reached the holy city Jerusalem, and thence he made Aleppo, where he dismounted at one of the caravansaries, and abode three days to rest himself and the mule, and to smell the air. Then, being determined to travel afar, and Allah having written safety in his fate, he set out again, wending without voting whither he was going, and Having fallen in with certain couriers, he stinted not travelling till he had reached Bazara city, albeit he knew not what the place was. It was dark night when he alighted at the Khan, so he spread out his prayer carpet and took down the saddle bags from the back of his mule and gave her with her furniture in charge of the doorkeeper that he might walk her about. The man took her and did as he was bid. Now it so happened that the wazir of Bazora, a man short in years, was sitting at the lattice window of his palace opposite the Khan, and he saw the porter walking the mule up and down. He was struck by her trappings of price, and thought her a nice beast fit for the ridings of wazirs or even the royalties, and the more he looked, the more he was perplexed, till at last he said to one of his pages, Bring hither your doorkeeper. The page went and returned to the wazir with the porter who kissed the ground between his hands and the minister asked him, Who is the owner of yonder mule and what manner of man is he? And he answered, O oh my lord, the owner of this mule is a comely young man of pleasant manners, withal grave and dignified and doubtless one of the sons of the merchants. When the wazir heard the doorkeeper's words, he arose forthright and, mounting his horse, rode to the Khan and went in to Nur al-Din, who, seeing the minister making toward him, rose to his feet and advanced to meet him and saluted him. The wazir welcomed him to Bazora and, dismounting, embraced him and made him sit down by his side and said, O my son, whence comest thou and what dost thou seek? O my lord! Nur al-Din replied, 
I have come from the Cairo city of which my father was whilom wazir, but he hath been removed to the grace of Allah. And he informed him of all that had befallen him from beginning to end, adding, I am resolved never to return home before I have seen all the cities and countries of the world. When the wazir heard this, he said to him, O my son, hearken not to the voice of passion, lest it cast thee into the pit. For indeed many regions be waste places, and I fear for thee the turns of time. Then he let load the saddle bags and the silk and prayer carpets on the mule and carried Nur al Din to his own house, where he lodged him in a pleasant place and entreated him honourably and made much of him, for he inclined to love him with exceeding love. After a while he said to him, O my son, here am I, left a man in years and have no male children, but Allah hath blessed me with a daughter who even at thee in beauty, and I have rejected all her many suitors, men of rank and substance, but affection for thee hath entered into my heart. Say me, then, will thou be to her a husband? If thou accept this, I will go up with thee to the Sultan of Bazora, and will tell him that thou art my nephew, the son of my brother, and bring thee to be appointed wazir in my place, that I may keep the house for, by Allah, O my son, I am stricken in years and a weary. When Nur al Din heard the Wazir's words, he bowed his head in modesty and said, To hear is to obey. At this the Wazir rejoiced and bade his servants prepare a feast and decorate the great assembly hall wherein they were wont to celebrate the marriages of emirs and grandees. Then he assembled his friends and the notables of the reign and the merchants of Bazora and when all stood before him, he said to them, I had a brother who was wazir in the land of Egypt, and Allah Almighty blessed him with two sons, whilst to me, as well ye what, he had given a daughter. My brother charged me to marry my daughter to one of his sons, whereto I assented, and when my daughter was of age to marry, he sent me one of his sons. The young man, now present, to whom I purpose marrying her, drawing up the contract, and celebrating the night of unveiling with due ceremony. For he is nearer and dearer to me than a stranger, and after the wedding, if he please, he shall abide with me, or if he desire to travel, I will forward him and his wife to his father's home. Hereat one and all replied, Right is thy reckoning. And they all looked at the bridegroom and were pleased with him. So the wazir sent for the Kazi and legal witnesses, and they wrote out the marriage contract, after which the slaves perfumed the guests with incense, and served them with sherbet of sugar, and sprinkled rose water on them, and all went their ways. Then the wazir bade his servants take Nur al Din to the Hammam bath, and send him a suit of the best of his own, a special raiment, and napkins, and towelry, and bowls, and perfume burners, and all else that was required. After the bath, when he came out and donned the dress, he was even as the full moon on the fourteenth night, and he mounted his mule, and stayed not till he reached the wazir's palace. There he dismounted, and went to the minister, and kissed his hands, and the wazir bade him welcome, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the twenty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir stood up to him and welcoming him said arise and go into the wife this night and on the morrow i'll carry thee to the sultan and pray allah bless thee with all manners of weal so nur al din left him and went into his wife the wazir's daughter thus far concerning him but as regards his eldest brother shams al din he was absent with the sultan a long time and when he returned from his journey he found not his brother and he asked of his servants and slaves who answered, On the day of thy departure with the Sultan, thy brother mounted his mule, fully caparisoned as for state procession, saying, I am going towards Kalyup town, and I shall be absent one day or at most two days, for my breast is straitened, and let none of you follow me. Then he fared forth, and from that time to this we have heard no tidings of him. Shams al Din was greatly troubled at the sudden disappearance of his brother and grieved with exceeding grief at the loss and said to himself, This is only because I chided and upbraided him the night before my departure with the Sultan. Haply his feelings were hurt 
and he fared forth a travelling but i must send after him then he went into the sultan and acquainted him with what had happened and wrote letters and dispatches which he sent by running footmen to its deputies in every province but during the 20 days of his brother's absence nur al-din had travelled and had reached bazora so after diligent search the messengers failed to come at any news of him and returned thereupon shams al-din despaired of finding his brother and said indeed i went beyond all bounds in what i said to him with reference to the marriage of our children would that i had not done so this all cometh of my lack of wit and want of caution soon after this he sought in marriage the daughter of a kairin merchant and drew up the marriage contract and went in to her and it so chanced that on the very same night when shams al-din went to his wife nur al-din also went to his wife the daughter of the wazir of bazora this being in accordance with the will of almighty allah that he might deal the decrees of destiny to his creatures furthermore it was as the two brothers had said for their two wives became pregnant by them on the same night and both were brought to bed on the same day the wife of shams al-din wazir of egypt of a daughter never in cairo was seen a fairer and the wife of nur al-din of a son none more beautiful was ever seen in, in his time as one of the poets said concerning the like of him that jerry hair that glossy brow my slender wasted youth of thine can darkness round creation throw or make it brightly shine the dusky mole that faintly shows upon his cheek ah blame it not the tulip flower never blows undarkened by its spot and as another also said his scent was musk and his cheek was rose his teeth are pearls and his lips drop wine his form is a brand and his hips a hill his hair is night and his face moonshine they named the boy badr al-din hasan and his grandfather the wazir of bazora rejoiced in him and on the seventh day after his birth made entertainments and spread banquets which would befit the birth of the king's sons and heirs then he took nur al-din and went up with him to the sultan and his son-in-law when he came before the presence of the king kissed the ground between his hands and repeated these verses for he was ready of speech firm of sprite and good in heart as he was goodly in form the world's best choice long be thy lot my lord and last while darkness and the dawn overlap o thou who makest when we greet thy gifts the world to dance and timed his palms to clap then the sultan rose up to honor them and thanking nur al-din for his fine compliment asked the wazir who may be this young man and the minister answered this is my brother's son and related his tale from first to last quoth the sultan and how comes he to be thy nephew and we have never heard speak of him quoth the minister o our lord the sultan i had a brother who was the wazir of the land of egypt and he died leaving two sons whereof the elder had taken his father's place and the younger whom thou seest came to me i had sworn i would not marry my daughter to any one but to him so when he came i married him to her now he is young and i am old my hearing is dulled and my judgment is easily fooled wherefore i would solicit our lord the sultan to set him in my stead for he is my brother's son and my daughter's husband and he is fit for the wazirate being a man of good counsel and ready contrivance the sultan looked at nur al-din and liked him so he established him in office as the wazir had requested and formally appointed him presenting him with a splendid dress of honor and a she mule from his private stud and assigning to him sold stipends and supplies nur al-din kissed the sultan's hand and went home he and his father-in-law joined with exceeding joy and saying all this followeth on the heels of the boy hasan's birth next day he presented himself before the king and kissing the ground began repeating grow thy weal and thy welfare day by day 
and thy luck prevail over the envious spite, and never cease thy days to be white as day, and thy foreman's day to be black as night. The Sultan bade him to be seated on the wazir's seat, so he sat down and applied himself to the business of his office and went into the cases of leads and their suits as is the wont of ministers. While the Sultan watched him and wondered at his wit and good sense, judgment and insight, wherefore he loved him and took him into intimacy. When the Diwan was dismissed, Nur al-Din returned to his house and related what had passed to his father-in-law who rejoiced. And thenceforward Nur al-Din ceased not so to administer the wazirate that the Sultan would not be parted from him night or day, and increased his stipend and supplies until his means were ample, and he became the owner of ships that made trading voyages at its command, as well as of Mamluks and Blackamoor slaves, and he laid out many estates and set up Persian wheels and planted gardens. When his son Hassan was four years of age, the old wazir deceased and he made for his father-in-law a sumptuous funeral ceremony ere he was laid in the dust. Then he occupied himself with the education of this son and when the boy waxed strong and came to the age of seven, he brought him a fakir, a doctor of law and religion, to teach him in his own house and charged him to give him a good education and instruct him in politeness and manners. So, the tutor made the boy read and retain all varieties of useful knowledge after he had spent some years in learning the Quran by heart. And he ceased not to grow in beauty and stature and symmetry. Even as saith the poet, In his face sky shines the fullest moon, in his cheeks anemone glows the sun. He so conquered beauty that he hath won all charms of humanity one by one. The professor brought him up in his father's palace, teaching him reading, writing and ciphering, theology and bellus letters. His grandfather, the old wazir, had bequeathed to him the whole of his property when he was but four years of age. Now, during all the time of his earliest youth, he had never left the house till, on a certain day, his father, the wazir Nur al-Din, clad him in his best clothes and mounting him on a she-mule of the finest, went up with him to the Sultan. The king gazed at Badr al-Din Hassan and marvelled at his comeliness and loved him. As for the city folk, when he first passed before them with his father, they marvelled at his exceeding beauty and sat down on the road, expecting his return, that they might look for their fill on his beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace. Even as the poet said in these verses, As the sage watched the stars, the semblance clear Of a fair youth on scroll he saw appear, Those jetty locks canopus over him threw, And tinged his temple curls a musky hue. Mars dyed his ruddy cheek, and from his eyes The archer star his glittering arrow flies. His wit from Hermes came, and so has care, the half-seen star that dimly haunts the bear, kept off all evil eyes that threaten and ensnare. The sage stood mazed to see such fortunes meet, and Luna kissed the earth beneath his feet. And they blessed him aloud as he passed and called upon Almighty Allah to bless him. The Sultan entreated the lad with especial favour and said to his father, O Wazir, thou must needs bring him daily to my presence. Whereupon he replied, I hear and I obey. Then the wazir returned home with his son and ceased not to carry him to court till he reached the age of twenty. At that time the minister sickened and, sending for Badr al-Din Hassan, said to him, Know, o my son, that the world of the present is but a house of mortality, while that of the future is a house of eternity. I wish, before I die, to bequeath thee certain charges, and do thou take heed of what I say, and incline thy heart to my words. Then he gave him last instructions as to the properest way of dealing with his neighbours, and the due management of his affairs, after which he called to mind his brother, and his home, and his native land, and wept over his separation from those he had first loved. Then. 
he wiped away his tears and turning to his son said to him before i proceed o my son to my last charges and injunctions know that i have a brother and though has an uncle shamsaldin hight the wazir of cairo which whom i parted leaving him against his will now take thee a sheet of paper and write upon it what so i say to thee badraldin took a fair leaf and set about doing his father's bidding and he wrote thereon a full account of what had happened to his sire first and last the dates of his arrival at bazora and of his foregathering with the wazir of his marriage of his going into the minister's daughter and of the birth of his son brief his life of 40 years from the date of his dispute with his brother adding the words and this is written at my dictation and may almighty allah be with him when i am gone then he folded the paper and sealed it and said o hasan o my son keep this paper with all care for it will enable thee to establish thine origin and rank and lineage and if anything contrary befall thee set out for cairo and ask for thine uncle and show him this paper and say to him that i died a stranger far from mine own people and full of yearning to see him and them so badraldin hasan took the document and folded it and wrapping it up in a piece of wax cloth of his skull cap and bound his light turban round it and he fell to weeping over his father and at parting with him and he but a boy then nur aldin lapsed into a swoon the forerunner of death but presently recovering himself he said o hasan o my son i will now bequeath to thee five last behests the first behest is be over intimate with none nor frequent any nor be familiar with any so shall thou be safe from his mischief for security lieth in seclusion of thought and a certain retirement from the society of thy fellows and i have heard it said by a poet in this world there is none thou mayst count upon to befriend thy case in the nick of need so live for thyself nursing hope of none such counsel i give thee you know take heed the second behest is o my son deal harshly with none lest fortune with thee deal hardly for the fortune of this world is one day with thee and another day against thee and all worldly goods are but a loan to be repaid and i have heard a poet say take thought nor has to win the thing thou wilt have ruth on man for ruth thou mayst require no hand is there but allah's hand is higher no tyrant but shall rule worse tyrants ire the third behest is learn to be silent in society and let thine own faults distract thine attention from the faults of other men for it is said in silence dwelleth safety and thereon i have heard the lines that tell us reserves a jewel silence safety is when as thou speakest many a word withhold for an of silence thou repent thee once of speech thou shall repent times manifold the fourth behest o my son is beware of wine bibbing for wine is the head of all frowardness and a fine solvent of human wits so shun and again i say shun mixing strong liquor for i have heard a poet say from wine turn and whoso wine cups will becoming one of those who deem it ill wine driveth man to miss salvation way and opes the gateway wide to sins that kill the fifth behest o my son is keep thy wealth and it will keep thee guard thy money and it will guard thee and waste not thy substance lest haply thou come to want and must fare a begging from the meanest of mankind save thy dirhams and deem them the sovereignest salve for the wounds of the world and here again i have heard that one of the poets say when fails my wealth no friend will deign befriend when wealth abounds all friends their friendship tender how many friends lent aid my wealth to spend but friends to lack of wealth no friendship render on this wise nur aldin ceased not to counsel his son badraldin hasan till his hour came and 
sighing one sobbing sigh his life went forth then the voice of mourning and keening rose high in his house and the sultan and all the grandees grieved for him and buried him but his son ceased not lamenting his loss for two months during which he never mounted horse nor attended the divan no presented himself before the sultan at last the king being wroth with him established his stead one of the chamberlains and made him wazir giving orders to seize and set seals on all nur al-din's houses and goods and domains so the new wazir went forth with a mighty posse of chamberlains and people of the divan and watchmen and a host of idlers to do this and to seize badr al-din hasan and to carry him before the king who would deal with him as he deemed fit now there was among the crowd of followers a mamluk of the diseased wazir who when he heard this order urged his horse and rode at full speed to the house of badr al-din hasan for he could not endure to see the ruin of his old master's son he found him sitting at the gate with head hung down and sorrowing as was his wont for the loss of his father so he dismounted and kissing his hand said to him o my lord and son of my lord haste ere ruin come and lay waste when hasan heard this he trembled and asked what may be the matter and the man answered the sultan is angered with thee and has issued a warrant against thee and evil cometh hard upon my track so flee with thy life at these words hasan's heart flamed with the fire of bale and his rose red cheek turned pale and he said to the mamluk o my brother is there time for me to go in and get me some worldly gear which may stand me in stead during my strangerhood but the slave replied o my lord up at once and save thyself and leave this house while it is yet time and he quoted these lines escape with thy life if oppression betide thee and let the house of its builders fate country for country thou wilt find if thou seek it life for life never early or late it is strange men should dwell in the house of abjection when the plain of god's earth is so wide and so great at these words of the mamluk Badr al-Din covered his head with the skirt of his garment and went forth on foot till he stood outside of the city where he heard folk saying the sultan has sent his new wazir to the house of the old wazir now no more to seal his property and seize his son Badr al-Din Hasan and take him before the presence that he may put him to death and all cried alas for his beauty and his loveliness when he heard this he fled forth at hazard knowing not whither he was going and gave not over hurrying onwards till destiny drove him to his father's tomb so he entered the cemetery and threading his way through the graves at last he reached the sepulchre where he sat down and let fall from his head the skirt of his long robe which was made of brocade with a gold embroidered hem whereon were worked these couplets o thou whose forehead like the radiant east tells of the stars of heaven and bounteous dews endure thine honor to the latest day and time thy grow of glory never refuse why he was sitting by his father's tomb behold there came to him a jew as he were a shroff a money changer with a pair of saddle bags containing much gold who accosted him and kissing his hand saying with a bound o my lord tis late in the day and thou art clad but lightly and I read signs of trouble in thy face. I was sleeping within this very hour," answered Hasan, "when my father appeared to me and chid me for not having visited his tomb. So I awoke trembling and came hither forthright, lest the day should go by without my visiting him, which would have been grievous to me. O oh my lord," rejoined the Jew, "thy father had many merchantmen at sea, and some of them are now due." It is my wish to buy of thee the cargo of the first ship that cometh into port with this thousand dinars of gold. I consent," quoth Hasan. Whereupon the Jew took out a bag of gold and counted out a thousand sequins, which he gave to Hasan, the son of Wazir, saying, "Write me a letter of sale and seal it." So Hasan took a pen and paper and wrote these words in duplicate. The writer, 
Hasan Badr al-Din, son of Wazir Nur al-Din, had to Isaac the Jew all the cargo of the first of his father's ships with Kamet into port for a thousand dinars and he had received the price in advance. And after he had taken one copy, the Jew put it into his pouch and went away. But Hassan fell a weeping as he thought of the dignity and prosperity which had erst been his and he began reciting. This house, my lady, since you left, is now a home no more. For me, not neighbours, since you left, prove kind and neighbourly. The friends will e'er I took to heart, alas, no more to me is friend, and even Luna's self displayeth lunacy. You left, and by your going, left the world a waste, a wolf, and lies a gloomy murk upon the face of hill and lea. O oh, may the raven bird whose cry our hapless parting croaked, find never a nasty home and ex shed all his plumery. At length my patience fails me and this absence wastes my flesh. How many a veil by severance rent our eyes are doomed to see. Ah, shall I ever sight again our fair past nights of yore? And shall a single house become a home for me once more? Then he wept with exceeding weeping and night came upon him. So he leaned his head against his father's grave and sleep overcame him. Glory to him who sleepeth not. He ceased not slumbering till the moon rose when his head slipped from off the tomb and he lay on his back with limbs outstretched, his face shining bright in the moonlight. Now the cemetery was haunted day and night by jinns who were of the true believers and Presently came out a genia who, seeing Hassan asleep, marvelled at his beauty and loveliness and cried, Glory to God, this youth can be none other than one of the Walden of Paradise. Then she flew firmament wards to circle it, as was her custom, and met an ifrit on the wing, who saluted her, and she said to him, Whence comest thou? From Cairo, he replied. Will thou come to me and look upon the beauty of a youth who sleepeth in yonder burial place? She asked and he answered, I will. So they flew till they lighted at the tomb and she showed him the youth and said, Now didst thou ever in thy born days see aught like this? The Ifrit looked upon him and exclaimed, Praise be to him that hath no equal. But, O my sister, shall I tell thee what I have seen this day? asked she, What is that? And he answered, I have seen the counterpart of this youth in the land of Egypt. She is the daughter of the Wazir Shams al -Din, and she is a model of beauty and loveliness, of fairest favour and formest form, and dight with symmetry and perfect grace. When she had reached the age of nineteen, the Sultan of Egypt heard of her, and sending for the Wazir her father, said to him, Hear me, O Wazir, it hath reached mine ear that thou hast a daughter, and I wish to demand her of thee in marriage. The Wazir replied, O our Lord the Sultan, deign accept my excuses and take compassion on my sorrows, for thou knowest that my brother, who was partner with me in the Wazirat, disappeared from amongst us many years ago, and we wot not where he is. Now, the cause of his departure was that one night, as we were sitting together and talking of wives and children to come, we had words on the matter and he went off in high dudgeon. But I swore that I would marry my daughter to none, save to the son of my brother, on the day her mother gave her birth, which was nigh upon nineteen years ago. I have lately heard that my brother died at Bazora, where he married the daughter of the wazir, and that she bare him a son. and. I will not marry my daughter but to him in honour of my brother's memory. I recorded the date of my marriage and the conception of my wife and the birth of my daughter and from her horoscope I find that her name is conjoined with that of her cousin and there are damsels in foison for our lord the sultan. The king hearing his minister's answer and refusal waxed troth with exceeding wrath and cried when the like of me asketh a girl in marriage of the like of thee, he conferreth an honour, and thou rejectest me, and putteth me off with cold excuses. Now 
by the life of my head i will marry her to the meanest of my men in spite of the nose of thee there was in the palace a horse groom which was a gobo with a bunch to his breast and a hunch to his back and the sultan sent for him and married him to the daughter of the wazir li for loth and hath ordered a pompous marriage procession for him and that he go in to his bride this very night i have now just flown hither from cairo where i left the hunchback at the door of the hammam bath amidst the sultan's white slaves who were waving lighted flambeaux about him as for the minister's daughter she sitteth among her nurses and tire women weeping and wailing for they have forbidden her father to come near her never have i seen o my sister more hideous being than this hunchback while as the young lady is the likest of all folk to this young man albeit even fairer than he and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased her permitted say end of section 14 of the book of a thousand nights and a night recording by priya for librivox Volume One of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Section Fifteen. When it was the twenty-second night, she said, "It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the genie narrated to the genie how the king had caused the wedding contract to be drawn up between the hunchbacked groom and the lovely young lady who was heartbroken for sorrow, and how she was the fairest of created things and even more beautiful than this youth, the genie cried at him, 'Thou liest! This youth is handsomer than any one of his day.'" The Ifrit gave her the lie again, adding, "By Allah, O my sister, the damsel I speak of is fairer than this. Yet none but he deserveth her, for they resemble each other like brother and sister, or at least cousins. And well away, how she is wasted upon that hunchback!" Then said she, "O my brother." Let us get under him and lift him up and carry him to Cairo, that we may compare him with the damsel of whom thou speakest, and so determine whether of the twain is the fairer. To hear is to obey," replied he. "Thou speakest to the point, nor is there a righter wrecking than this of thine, and I myself will carry him." So he raised him from the ground and flew with him like a bird soaring in upper air. The Ifrita keeping close by his side at equal speed, till he alighted with him in the city of Cairo and set him down on a stone bench and woke him up. He roused himself and finding that he was no longer at his father's tomb in Bassorah city, he looked right and left and saw that he was in a strange place, and he would have cried out, but the Ifrit gave him a cuff which persuaded him to keep silence. Then he brought him rich raiment. And clothed him therein, and giving him a lighted flambeau, said, "Know that I have brought thee hither, meaning to do thee a good turn for the love of Allah. So take this torch and mingle with the people at the hammam door, and walk on with them without stopping till thou reach the house of the wedding festival. Then go boldly forward and enter the great saloon, and fear none." But take thy stand at the right hand of the hunchback bridegroom, and, as often as any of the nurses and tire women and singing girls come up to thee, put thy hand into thy pocket, which thou wilt find filled with gold. Take it out, and throw it to them, and spare not, for as often as thou thrustest fingers in pouch, thou shalt find it full of coin. Give largesse by hands full, and fear nothing. But set thy trust upon him who created thee, 
for this is not by thine own strength, but by that of Allah Almighty, that his decrees may take effect upon his creatures. When Badr al-Din Hassan heard these words from the Ifrit, he said to himself, Would heaven I knew what all this means, and what is the cause of such kindness? However, he mingled with the people, and, lighting his flambeau, moved on with the bridal procession till he came to the bath, where he found the hunchback already on horseback. Then he pushed his way in among the crowd, a veritable beauty of a man in the finest apparel, wearing tarbouche and turban, and a long-sleeved robe purfled with gold. And, as often as the singing women stopped for the people to give them largesse, he thrust his hand into his pocket, and finding it full of gold, took out a handful and threw it on the tambourine till he had filled it with gold pieces for the music girls and the tire women. The singers were amazed by his bounty, and the people marveled at his beauty and loveliness and the splendor of his dress. He ceased not to do thus, till he reached the mansion of the wazir, who was his uncle, where the chamberlains drove back the people and forbade them to go forward. But the singing girls and the tirewomen said, By Allah, we will not enter unless this young man enter with us, for he hath given us length of life with his largesse, and we will not display the bride unless he be present. Therewith they carried him into the bridal hall, and made him sit down defying the evil glances of the hunchback bridegroom. The wives of the emirs and wazirs and chamberlains and courtiers all stood in double line, each holding a massy cierge ready lighted. All wore thin face veils, and the two rows right and left extended from the bride's throne to the head of the hall adjoining the chamber whence she was to come forth. When the ladies saw Badr al-Din Hassan, and noted his beauty and loveliness, and his face that shone like the new moon, their hearts inclined to him, and the singing girls said to all that were present, Know that this beauty crossed our hands with naught but red gold, so be not chary to do him womanly service, and comply with all he says, no matter what he asks. So all the women crowded around Hassan with their torches, and gazed upon his loveliness, and envied him his beauty. And one and all would gladly have lain on his bosom an hour, or rather a year. Their hearts were so troubled that they let fall their veils from before their faces, and said, Happy she who belongeth to this youth, or to whom he belongeth. And they called down curses on the crooked groom, and on him who was the cause of his marriage to the girl beauty. And as often as they blessed Badr al-Din Hassan, they damned the hunchback, saying, Verily, this youth and none else deserveth our bride. Ah, well away for such a lovely one with this hideous Quasimodo. Allah's curse light on his head, and on the sultan who commanded the marriage. Then the singing girls beat their tabrets and lullalooed with joy, announcing the appearing of the bride, and the wazir's daughter came in, surrounded by her tirewomen who had made her goodly to look upon, for they had perfumed her and incensed her and adorned her hair, and they had robed her in raiment and ornaments befitting the mighty Chosroes kings. The most notable part of her dress was a loose robe worn over her other garments. It was diapered in red gold with figures of wild beasts, and birds whose eyes and beaks were of gems, and claws of red rubies and green beryl. And her neck was graced with a necklace of Yamani work, worth thousands of gold pieces, whose bezels were great round jewels, of sorts the like of which was never owned by Kaiser or by Toba King. And the bride was as the full moon when at fullest on fourteenth night. And as she paced into the hall, she was like one of the houris of heaven. Praise be to him who created her in such splendor of beauty. The ladies encompassed her as the white contains the black of the eye, they clustering like stars, whilst she shone among them like the moon when it eats up the clouds. Now Badr al-Din Hassan of Basora was sitting in full gaze of the folk when the bride came forward with her graceful swaying and swimming gait. 
and her hunchback groom stood up to meet and receive her. She, however, turned away from the white, and walked forward till she stood before her cousin Hassan, the son of her uncle. Whereat the people laughed. But when the wedding guests saw her thus attracted toward Badr al-Din, they made a mighty clamor, and the singing women shouted their loudest. Whereupon he put his hand into his pocket, and pulling out a handful of gold, cast it into their tambourines, and the girls rejoiced, and said, Could we win our wish, this bride were thine? At this he smiled, and the folk came round him flambeau in hand, like the eyeball round the pupil, while the gabo bridegroom was left sitting alone, much like a tailless baboon. For every time they lighted a candle for him, it went out willy-nilly, so he was left in darkness and silence and looking at naught but himself. When Badr al-Din Hassan saw the bridegroom sitting lonesome in the dark, and all the wedding guests with their flambeau and wax candles crowding around himself, he was bewildered and marveled much. But when he looked at his cousin, the daughter of his uncle, he rejoiced and felt an inward delight. He longed to greet her and gazed intently on her face, which was radiant with light and brilliancy. Then the tire-women took off her veil, and displayed her in the first bridal dress, which was of scarlet satin. And Hassan had a view of her which dazzled his sight and dazed his wits, as she moved to and fro, swaying with graceful gait. And she turned the heads of all the guests, women as well as men, for she was even, as saith the surpassing poet, A sun on wand in knoll of sand she showed, Clad in her cramoisy hued chemisette. Of her lips honey-dew she gave me drink, And with her rosy cheeks quenched fire she set. Then they changed that dress and displayed her in a robe of azure, And she reappeared like the full moon when it riseth over the horizon, with her coal-black hair and cheeks delicately fair, and teeth shone in sweet smiling, and breasts firm rising, and crowning sides of the softest and waist of the roundest. And in this second suit she was as a certain master of high conceits, saith of the like of her. She came apparelled in an azure vest, ultramarine as skies are decked and dight, I viewed the unparalleled sight which showed my eyes a moon of summer on a winter night. Then they changed that suit for another, and veiling her face in the luxuriance of her hair, loosed her love locks, so dark, so long, that their darkness and length outvied the darkest nights. And she shot through all hearts with the magical shaft of her eye-babes. They displayed her in the third dress, and she was, as said of her the sayer, Veiling her cheeks with hair a morn she comes, And I her mischiefs with a cloud compare, Saying, Thou veilest morn with night. Ah, no, quoth she, I shroud full moon with darkling air. Then they displayed her in the fourth bridal dress, and she came forward shining like the rising sun, and swaying to and fro with lovesome grace and supple ease like a gazelle fawn. And she clave all hearts with the arrows of her eyelashes, even as saith one who described a charmer like her. The sun of beauty she to sight appears, and, lovely coy, she mocks all loveliness. And when he fronts her favor and her smile a morn, the sun of day in clouds must dress. Then she came forth in the fifth dress, a very light of loveliness, like a wand of waving willow or a gazelle of the thirsty wold. Those locks which stung like scorpions along her cheeks were bent, and her neck was bowed in blandishment, and her hips quivered as she went, as saith one of the poets describing her in verse. She comes like fullest moon on happy night, Taper of waist with shape of magic might. She hath an eye whose glances quell mankind, And ruby on her cheeks reflects his light, And veils her hips the blackness of her hair. Beware of curls that bite with viper bite. 
her sides are silken soft, the while the heart, mere rock behind that surface, lurks from sight. From the fringed curtains of her eyne she shoots shafts which at farthest range on mark alight. When round her neck or waist I throw my arms, her breasts repel me with their hardened height. Ah, how her beauty all excels! Ah, how that shape transcends the graceful waving bow! Then they adorned her with the sixth toilette, a dress which was green. And now she shamed her slender straightness, the nut-brown spear. Her radiant face dimmed the brightest beams of full moon, and she outdid the bending branches in gentle movement and flexible grace. Her loveliness exalted the beauties of earth's four quarters, and she broke men's hearts by the significance of her semblance, for she was even as saith one of the poets in these lines. A damsel twas the tyrer's art had decked with snares and slight, and robed in rays as though the sun from her had borrowed light. She came before us, wondrous clad in chemisette of green, as veiled by its leafy screen pomegranate hides from sight. And when he said, How callest thou the manner of thy dress? She answered us in pleasant way, with double meaning dight. We call this garment creve cur, and rightly is it height, for many a heart with this we broke, and conquered many a sprite. Then they displayed her in the seventh dress, colored between safflower and saffron, even as one of the poets saith. In vest of saffron pale and safflower red, musked, sandaled, ambergreased, she came to front. Rise, cried her youth. Go forth and show thyself. Sit, said her hips, we cannot bear the brunt. And when I craved about, her beauty said, Do, do, and said, her pretty shame, Don't, don't. Thus they displayed the bride in all her seven toilettes before Hassan al-Basri, wholly neglecting the gabo who sat moping alone. And when she opened her eyes, she said, O Allah, Make this man my good man, and deliver me from the evil of this hunchback groom. As soon as they had made an end of this part of the ceremony, they dismissed the wedding guests who went forth, women, children, and all, and none remained save Hassan and the hunchback, whilst the tirewoman led the bride into an inner room to change her garb and gear and get her ready for the bridegroom. Thereupon Quasimodo came up to Badr al-Din Hassan and said, O my lord, thou hast cheered us this night with thy good company, and overwhelmed us with thy kindness and courtesy. But now, why not get thee up and go? Bismallah, he answered, in Allah's name so be it. And rising, he went forth by the door, where the Ifrit met him and said, Stay in thy stead, O Badr al-Din. And when the hunchback goes out to the closet of ease, go in without losing time and seat thyself in the alcove. And when the bride comes, say to her, "'Tis I am thy husband, for the king devised this trick, only fearing for thee the evil eye. And he whom thou sawest is but a syce, a groom, one of our stablemen. Then walk boldly up to her and unveil her face for jealousy hath taken us of this matter. While Hassan was still talking with the Ifrit, behold, the groom fared forth from the hall, and entering the closet of ease, sat down on the stool. Hardly had he done this, when the Ifrit came out of the tank, wherein the water was, in semblance of a mouse, and squeaked out, Zeek! Quoth the hunchback, What ails thee? And the mouse grew and grew till it became a coal-black cat, and caterwauled, Meow! Meow! Then it grew still more and more till it became a dog, and barked out, Ow! Ow! When the bridegroom saw this, he was frightened, and exclaimed, Out with thee, O unlucky one! But the dog grew and swelled till it became an ass-colt that brayed and snorted in his face, Hulk! Hulk! Whereupon the hunchback quaked and cried, Come to my aid, O people of the house. But behold, 
the ass colt grew and became big as a buffalo and walled the way before him and spake with the voice of the sons of adam saying woe to thee o thou bunchback thou stinkard o thou filthiest of grooms hearing this the groom was seized with a colic and he sat down on the jakes in his clothes with teeth chattering and knocking together quoth the ifrit is the world so straight to thee thou findest none to marry save my lady love but as he was silent the ifrit continued answer me or i will do thee dwell in the dust by allah replied the gobbo o king of the buffaloes this is no fault of mine for they forced me to wed her and verily i wot not that she had a lover among the buffaloes but now i repent first before allah and then before thee said the ifrit to him i swear to thee that if thou fare forth from this place or thou utter a word before sunrise i assuredly will wring thy neck when the sun rises when thy went and never more return to this house so saying the ifrit took up the gobbo of bridegroom and set him head downwards and feet upwards in the slit of the privy and said to him I will leave thee here, but I shall be on the lookout for thee till sunrise, and if thou stir before then, I will seize thee by the feet and dash out thy brains against the wall. So look out for thy life. Thus far concerning the hunchback. But as regards Badr al-Din Hassan of Basora, he left the gabo and the ifrit jangling and wrangling, and going into the house sat him down in the very middle of the alcove. And behold, in came the bride, attended by an old woman who stood at the door, and said, O father of uprightness, arise and take what God giveth thee. Then the old woman went away, and the bride, Sit al Husn, or the Lady of Beauty Height, entered the inner part of the alcove, broken hearted, and saying in herself, By Allah, I will never yield my person to him, no, not even were he to take my life. But as she came to the further end, she saw Badr al-Din Hassan, and she said, Dearling, art thou still sitting here? By Allah I was wishing that thou wert my bridegroom, or at least that thou and the hunchbacked horse-groom were partners in me. He replied, O oh, beautiful lady! How should the Sice have access to thee, and how should he share in thee with me? Then quoth she, Who is my husband, thou or he? Sit al Husn, rejoined Hassan, We have not done this for mere fun, but only as a device to ward off the evil eye from thee. For when the tire women and singers and wedding guests saw thy beauty being displayed to me, they feared fascination and thy father hired the horse-groom for ten dinars and a porringer of meat to take the evil eye off us, and now he hath received his hire and gone his gait. When the Lady of Beauty heard these words, she smiled and rejoiced, and laughed a pleasant laugh. Then she whispered him, By the Lord thou hast quenched a fire which tortured me, and now by Allah, O my little dark-haired darling, Take me to thee, and press me to thy bosom. Then she began singing. By Allah set thy foot upon my soul, Since long, long years for this alone I long, And whisper tale of love in ear of me. To me tis sweeter than the sweetest song. No other youth upon my heart shall lie, So do it often, dear, and do it long. Then she stripped off her outer gear, and she threw open her chemise from the neck downwards, and showed her parts genital and all the rondure of her hips. When Badr al-Din saw the glorious sight, his desires were roused, and he arose and doffed her clothes. And wrapping up in his bag trousers the purse of gold which he had taken from the Jew, and which contained the thousand dinars, he laid it under the edge of the bedding. Then he took off his turban and set it upon the settle, atop of his other clothes, remaining in his skull-cap and fine shirt of blue silk laced with gold. Whereupon 
the lady of beauty drew him to her and he did likewise then he took her to his embrace and set her legs round his waist and point blank that cannon placed where it battereth down the bulwark of maidenhead and layeth it waste and he found her a pearl unpierced and unthridden and a filly by all men save himself unridden and he abated her virginity and had joyance of her youth in his virility and presently he withdrew sword from sheath and then returned to the fray right eath and when the battle and the siege had finished some fifteen assaults he had furnished and she conceived by him that very night then he laid his hand under her head and she did the same and they embraced and fell asleep in each other's arms as a certain poet said of such lovers in these couplets visit thy lover spurn what envy told no envious churl shall smile and love and soul merciful allah made no fairer sight than coupled lovers single couch doth hold breast pressing breast and robed in joys their own with pillowed forearms cast in finest mould and when heart speaks to heart with tongue of love folk who would part them hammer steel ice cold if a fair friend thou find who cleaves to thee live for that friend that friend in heart and fold o ye who blame for love us lover kind say can ye minister to diseased mind this much concerning Badr al-Hasan and Sit al-Husn his cousin, but as regards the Ifrit, as soon as he saw the twain asleep, he said to the Ifritah, Arise, slip thee under the youth, and let us carry him back to his place ere dawn overtake us, for the day is near hand. Thereupon she came forward, and, getting under him as he lay asleep, took him up clad only in his fine blue shirt leaving the rest of his garments, and ceased not flying, and the ifrit vying with her in flight, till the dawn advised them that it had come upon them midway, and the muezzin began his call from the minaret, Haste ye to salvation, haste ye to salvation. Then Allah suffered his angelic host to shoot down the ifrit with a shooting star, so he was consumed. But the Ifritah escaped, and she descended with Badr al-Din at the place where the Ifrit was burnt, and did not carry him back to Basora, fearing lest he come to harm. Now by the order of him who predestineth all things, they alighted at Damascus of Syria, and the Ifritah set down her burden at one of the city gates and flew away. When day arose and the doors were opened, the folks who came forth saw a handsome youth with no other raiment but his blue shirt of gold-embroidered silk and skull-cap, lying upon the ground, drowned in sleep, after the hard labor of the night, which had not suffered him to take his rest. So the folk looking at him said, O oh, her luck with whom this one spent the night, but would he had waited to don his garments? Quoth another, a sorry lot are the sons of great families. Haply he but now came forth of the tavern on some occasion of his own, and his wine flew to his head, whereby he hath missed the place he was making for, and strayed till he came to the gate of the city, and finding it shut, lay him down, and to bye-bye. As the people were bandying guesses about him, suddenly the morning breeze blew upon Badr al-Din, and raising his shirt to his middle, showed a stomach and navel with something below it, and legs and thighs clear as crystal and smooth as cream. Cried the people, By Allah he is a pretty fellow. And at the cry Badr al-Din awoke, and found himself lying at a city gate with a crowd gathered around him. At this he greatly marveled, and asked, Where am I, O good folk? And what causeth you thus to gather round me, and what have I had to do with you? And they answered, We found thee lying here asleep during the call to dawn prayer, and this is all we know of the matter. But where didst thou lie last night? By Allah, O good people, replied he, I lay last night in Cairo. Said somebody, Thou hast surely been eating hashish. 
and another, he's a fool, and a third, he is a citri, and a fourth asked him, Art thou out of thy mind? Thou sleepest in Cairo, and thou wakest in the morning at the gate of Damascus city? Cried he, By Allah, my good people, one and all, I lie not to you. Indeed, I lay yesternight in the land of Egypt, and yesternoon I was at Bassora. Quoth one, Well, well. And quoth another, Ho, ho. And a third, So, so. And a fourth cried, This youth is mad, is possessed of the jinni. So they clapped hands at him and said to one another, Alas, the pity of it for his youth. By Allah, a madman and madness is no respecter of persons. Then they said to him, Collect thy wits and return to thy reason. How couldst thou be in Bassora yesterday, and Cairo yesternight, and withal awake in Damascus this morning? But he persisted. Indeed, I was a bridegroom in Cairo last night. Belike thou hast been dreaming, rejoined they, and sawest all this in thy sleep. So Hassan took thought for a while, and said to them, By Allah, this is no dream, nor vision-like doth it seem. I certainly was in Cairo, where they displayed the bride before me, in presence of a third person, the hunchback groom who was sitting hard by. By Allah, O oh my brother, this be no dream, and if it were a dream, where is the bag of gold I bore with me, and where are my turban and my robe and my trousers? Then he rose and entered the city, threading its highways and byways and bazaar streets. And the people pressed upon him and jeered at him, crying out, Madman, madman, till he, beside himself with rage, took refuge in a cook's shop. Now that cook had been a trifle too clever, that is, a rogue and a thief. But Allah had made him repent and turn from his evil ways and opened a cook shop. And all the people of Damascus stood in fear of his boldness and his mischief. So when the crowd saw the youth enter his shop, they dispersed, being afraid of him, and went their ways. The cook looked at Badr al-Din, and noting his beauty and loveliness, fell in love with him forthright, and said, Whence comest thou, O youth? Tell me at once thy tale, for thou art become dearer to me than my soul. So Hassan recounted to him all that had befallen him from beginning to end, but in repetition there is no fruition, and the cook said, O my lord Badr al-Din, doubtless thou knowest that this case is wondrous and this story marvellous. Therefore, O my son, hide what hath betided thee till Allah dispel what ills be thine, and tarry with me here the meanwhile, for I have no child, and I will adopt thee. Badr al-Din replied, Be it as thou wilt, O my uncle. Whereupon the cook went to the bazaar and bought him a fine suit of clothes and made him don it, then fared with him to the Kazi and formally declared that he was his son. So Badr al-Din Hassan became known in Damascus city as the cook's son, and he sat with him in the shop to take the silver, and on this wise he sojourned there for a time thus far concerning him. But as regards his cousin, the Lady of Beauty, when morning dawned she awoke and missed Badr al-Din Hassan from her side. But she thought that he had gone to the privy, and she sat expecting him for an hour or so. When, behold, entered her father Shams al-Din Mohammed, wazir of Egypt. Now he was disconsolate by reason of what had befallen him through the Sultan who had entreated him harshly, and had married his daughter by force to the lowest of his menials. And he too, a lump of a groom, bunch-backed withal, and he said to himself, I will slay this daughter of mine, if of her own free will she have yielded her person to this accursed carl. So he came to the door of the bride's private chamber, and said, Ho! Oh, sit al Husn. She answered him, Here am I, here am I, O oh my lord and came out unsteady of gait after the pains and pleasures of the night. And she kissed his hand, her face showing redoubled brightness and beauty for having lain in the arms of that gazelle, her cousin. 
When her father the wazir saw her in such case, he asked her, O oh, thou accursed, art thou rejoicing because of this horse-groom? And Sit al Husn smiled sweetly, and answered, By Allah, don't ridicule me. Enough of what passed yesterday when folk laughed at me, and evened me with that groom-fellow who is not worthy to bring my husband's shoes or slippers, nay, who is not worth the paring of my husband's nails. By the Lord, never in my life have I nighted a night so sweet as yesternight, so don't mock me by reminding me of the gabo. When her parent heard her words, he was filled with fury, and his eyes glared and stared, so that little of them showed save the whites, and he cried, Fie upon thee! What words are these? T'was the hunchbacked horse-groom who passed the night with thee. Allah upon thee, replied the Lady of Beauty, do not worry me about the gabo. Allah damn his father, and leave jesting with me for this groom was only hired for ten dinars and a porringer of meat, and he took his wage and went his way. As for me, I entered the bridal chamber, where I found my true bridegroom sitting, after the singer-women had displayed him to me, the same who had crossed their hands with red gold till every pauper that was present waxed wealthy. And I passed the night on the breast of my bonny man, a most lively darling, with his black eyes and joined eyebrows. When her parent heard these words, the light before his face became night, and he cried out at her, saying, O thou whore, what is this thou tellest me? Where be thy wits? O my father, she rejoined, thou breakest my heart. Enough for thee that thou hast been so hard upon me. Indeed, my husband, who took my virginity, is but just now gone to the draft-house and I feel that I have conceived by him. The wazir rose in much marvel and entered the privy where he found the hunchback groom with his head in the hole and his heels in the air. At this sight he was confounded and said, This is none other than he, the rascal hunchback. So he called to him, Ho, hunchback! The gabo grunted out, Tagum, tagum, thinking it was the ifrit spoke to him. So the wazir shouted at him and said, Speak out or I'll strike off thy pate with this sword. Then quoth the hunchback, By Allah, O sheikh of the Ifrits, ever since thou settest me in this place, I have not lifted my head. So Allah upon thee, take pity and entreat me kindly. When the wazir heard this, he asked, What is this thou sayest? I am bride's father and no Ifrit. Enough for thee that thou hast well now done me die, answered Quasimodo. Now go thy ways before he come upon thee who hath served me thus. Could ye not marry me to any save the lady love of buffaloes and the beloved of Ifrits? Allah curse her and curse him who married me to her and was the cause of this my case. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 15 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 1, Section 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 16 of Volume 1 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Sir Richard Burton. When it was the twenty-third night, said she, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the hunchbacked groom spake to the bride's father, saying, Allah curse him who was the cause of this my case. Then said the wazir to him, Up and out of this place. Am I mad, cried the groom, that I should go with thee without leave of the ifrit whose last words to me were, When the sun rises, arise and go thy gate. So hath the sun risen or no, for I dare not budge from this place till then. Asked the wazir, 
who brought thee hither? And he answered, I came here yesternight for a call of nature, and to do what none can do for me, when, lo, a mouse came out of the water, and squeaked at me, and swelled, and waxed gross, till it was big as a buffalo, and spoke to me words that entered my ears. Then he left me here, and went away. Allah curse the bride, and him who married me to her. The wazir walked up to him, and lifted his head out of the cesspool hole, and he fared forth, running for dear life, and hardly crediting that the sun had risen, and repaired to the sultan, to whom he told all that had befallen him with the Ifrit. But the wazir returned to the bride's private chamber, sore troubled in spirit about her, and said to her, O oh, my daughter, explain this strange matter to me. Quoth she, "'Tis simply this. The bridegroom, to whom they displayed me yester eve, lay with me all night, and took my virginity, and I am with child by him. He is my husband, and if thou believe me not, there are his turban, twisted as it was, lying on the settle, and his dagger, and his trousers beneath the bed, with a something, I wot not what, wrapped up in them. When her father heard this, he entered the private chamber, and found the turban which had been left there by Badr al-Din Hassan, his brother's son, and he took it in hand and turned it over, saying, This is the turban worn by wazirs, save that it is of Mosul stuff. So he opened it, and finding what seemed to be an amulet sewn up in the fez, he unsewed the lining and took it out. Then he lifted up the trousers, wherein was the purse of the thousand gold pieces, and opening that also, found in it a written paper. This he read, and it was the sale receipt of the Jew, in the name of Badr al-Din Hassan, son of Nur al-Din Ali, the Egyptian, and the thousand dinars were also there. No sooner had Shams al-Din read this, than he cried out with a loud cry, and fell to the ground fainting. And as soon as he revived and understood the gist of the matter, he marvelled and said, There is no God but the God, who Almighty is over all things. Knowest thou, O my daughter, who it was that became the husband of thy virginity? No, answered she, and he said, Verily, he is the son of my brother, thy cousin, and this thousand dinars is thy dowry. Praise be to Allah, and would I wot how this matter came about. Then opened he the amulet, which was sewn up, and found therein a paper in the handwriting of his deceased brother, Nur ad-Din the Egyptian father of Badr al-Din Hassan, and when he saw the handwriting, he kissed it again and again, and he wept and wailed over his dead brother, and improvised these lines. I see their traces, and with pain I melt, and on their whilom homes I weep and yearn, and him I pray who dealt this parting blow, some day he deign vouchsafe a safe return. When he ceased versifying, he read the scroll, and found in it recorded the dates of his brother's marriage with the daughter of the wazir of Basura, and of his going into her, and her conception, and the birth of Badr al-Din Hassan, and all his brother's history and doings up to his dying day. So he marvelled much, and shook with joy, and comparing the dates with his own marriage, and going into his wife, and the birth of their daughter, Sitt al-Husn, he found that they perfectly agreed. So he took the document, and repairing with it to the sultan, acquainted him with what had passed, from first to last, whereat the king marvelled, and commanded the case to be at once recorded. The wazir abode that day, expecting to see his brother's son, but he came not, and he waited a second day, a third day, and so on to the seventh day, without any tidings of him. So he said, By Allah, I will do a deed such as none hath ever done before me, and he took reed pen and ink, and drew upon a sheet of paper the plan of the whole house, showing whereabouts was the private chamber, with the curtain in such a place, and the furniture in such another, and so on with all that was in the room. Then he folded up the sketch, and causing all the furniture to be collected, he took Badr al-Din's garments, and the turban and fez and robe and purse, and carried the whole to his house, and locked them up against the coming of his nephew, Badr al-Din Hassan, the son of his lost brother, with an iron padlock on which he set his seal. As for the wazir's daughter, 
when her tale of months was fulfilled, she bare a son like the full moon, the image of his father in beauty and loveliness and fair proportions and perfect grace. They cut his navel-string and cold his eyelids to strengthen his eyes, and gave him over to the nurses and nursery governesses, naming him Ajib the Wonderful. His day was as a month, and his month was as a year, and when seven years had passed over him, his grandfather sent him to school, enjoining the master to teach him Quran reading, and to educate him well. He remained at the school four years, till he began to bully his schoolfellows, and abuse them, and bash them, and thrash them, and say, Who among you is like me? I am the son of the Wazir of Egypt. At last the boys came in a body to the monitor, of what hard usage they were wont to have from Ajib, and he said to them, I will tell you somewhat you may do to him, so that he shall leave off coming to the school, and it is this. When he enters to-morrow, sit ye down about him, and say some one of you to some other, By Allah, none shall play with us at this game, except he tell us the names of his mamma and his papa, for he who knows not the names of his mother and his father is a bastard, a son of adultery, and he shall not play with us. When the morning dawned, the boys came to school, Aji being one of them, and all flocked around him, saying, We will play a game wherein none can join, save he can tell the name of his mamma and his papa. And they all cried, By Allah, good! Then quoth one of them, My name is Majid, and my mammy's name is Alawiya, and my daddy's is Zaddin. Another spoke in like guise, and yet a third, till Ajib's turn came, and he said, My name is Ajib, and my mother's is Sitt al Husn, and my father's Shams Zaddin, the wazir of Cairo. By Allah, cried they, the wazir is not thy true father. Ajib answered, the wazir is my father in very deed. Then the boys all laughed and clapped their hands at him, saying, He does not know who is his papa. Get out from among us, for none shall play with us, except he know his father's name. Thereupon they dispersed from around him, and laughed him to scorn. So his breast was straightened, and he well nigh choked with tears and hurt feelings. Then said the monitor to him, We know that the wazir is thy grandfather, the father of thy mother, Sitt al Husn, and not thy father. As for thy father, neither dost thou know him, nor yet do we. For the sultan married thy mother to the hunchbacked horse groom, but the jinni came and slept with her, and thou hast no known father. Leave then, comparing thyself too advantageously with the little ones of the school, till thou know that thou hast a lawful father for until then thou wilt pass for a child of adultery amongst them. Seest thou that not even a huckster's son knoweth his own sire? Thy grandfather is the wazir of Egypt, but as for thy father, we wot him not, and we say indeed that thou hast none, so return to thy sound senses. When Ajib heard these insulting words from the monitor and the schoolboys, and understood the reproach they put upon him, he went out and ran at once to his mother, Sitt al Husn, to complain, but he was crying so bitterly that his tears prevented his speech for a while. When she heard his sobs and saw his tears, her heart burned as though with fire for him, and she said, O oh my son, why dost thou weep? Allah keep the tears from thine eyes. Tell me what hath betided thee. So he told her all that he heard from the boys and from the monitor, and ended with asking, and who, O oh my mother, is my father? She answered, Thy father is the wazir of Egypt. But he said, Do not lie to me. The wazir is thy father, not mine. Who then is my father? Except thou tell me the very truth, I will kill myself with this hanger. When his mother heard him speak of his father, she wept, remembering her cousin and her bridal night with him, and all that occurred thereon and then. And she repeated these couplets. Love in my heart they lit and went their ways, And all I loved to furthest lands withdrew, And when they left me sufferance also left, And when we parted patience bade adieu. They fled, and flying with my joys they fled, In very consistency my spirit flew, They made my eyelids flow with severance tears, And to the parting pang these drops are due. And when I long to see reunion day, My groans prolonging sore for Ruth I sue. 
Then in my heart of hearts their shapes I trace, And love and longing, care and cark, renew. O ye whose names cling round me like a cloak, Whose love yet closer than a shirt I drew, Beloved ones, how long this hard despite, How long this severance and this coy shy flight. Then she wailed and shrieked aloud, and her son did the like, and behold, in came the wazir, whose heart burnt within him at the sight of their lamentations, and he said, What makes you weep? So the lady of beauty acquainted him with what had happened between her son and the schoolboys, and he also wept, calling to mind his brother, and what had passed between them, and what had betided his daughter, and how he had failed to find out what mystery there was in the matter. Then he rose at once, and repairing to the audience hall, went straight to the king, and told his tale, and craved his permission to travel eastward to the city of Bassorah, and ask after his brother's son. Furthermore, he besought the sultan to write for him letters patent, authorizing him to seize upon Badr al-Din, his nephew and son-in-law, wheresoever he might find him. And he wept before the king, who had pity on him, and wrote royal autographs to his deputies in all climes and countries and cities, whereat the wazir rejoiced and prayed for blessings on him. Then, taking leave of his sovereign, he returned to his house, where he equipped himself and his daughter and his adopted child, Ajib, with all things meet for a long march, and set out and travelled the first day, and the second, and the third, and so forth, till he arrived at Damascus city. He found it a fair place, abounding in trees and streams, even as the poet said of it. When I nighted and dayed in Damascus town, Time swear such another he ne'er should view, And careless we slept under wing of night, Till dappled morn gan her smiles renew, And dewdrops on branch in their beauty hung, Like pearls to be dropped when the zephyr blew, And the lake was the page where birds read and note, And the cloud set points to what breezes wrote. The wazir encamped on the open space called Al-Hassa, and after pitching tents, said to his servants, A halt here for two days. So they went into the city upon their several occasions, this to sell, and this to buy, this to go to the Hammam, and that to visit the cathedral mosque of the Banu Umayya, the Omeyadis, whose like is not in this world. Ajib also went, with his attendant eunuch, for solace and diversion to the city, and the servant followed with a quarter-staff of almond wood, so heavy that if he struck a camel therewith, the beast would never rise again. When the people of Damascus saw Ajib's beauty and brilliancy, and perfect grace and symmetry, for he was a marvel of comeliness and winning loveliness, softer than the cool breeze of the north, sweeter than limpid waters to a man in drouth, and pleasanter than the health for which sick man sueth. A mighty many followed him, whilst others ran on before, and sat down on the road until he should come up, that they might gaze on him, till, as destiny had decreed, the eunuch stopped opposite the shop of Ajib's father, Badr al-Din Hassan. Now his beard had grown long and thick, and his wits had ripened during the twelve years which had passed over him, and the cook and ex-rogue having died, the so-called Hassan of Basura had succeeded to his goods and shop, for that he had been formally adopted before the Kazi and witnesses. When his son and the eunuch stepped before him, he gazed on Ajib, and seeing how very beautiful he was, his heart fluttered and throbbed, and blood drew to blood, and natural affection spake out, and his bowels yearned over him. He had just dressed a conserve of pomegranate grains with sugar, and heaven-implanted love wrought within him. So he called to his son Ajib, and said, O my lord, O thou who hast gotten the mastery of my heart, and my very vitals, and to whom my bowels yearn, say me, wilt thou enter my house, and solace my soul by eating of my meat? Then his eyes streamed with tears which he could not stay, for he bethought him of what he had been and what he had become. When Ajib heard his father's words, his heart also yearned himwards, and he looked at the eunuch and said to him, Of a truth, O my good guard, my heart yearns to this cook. He is as one that hath a son far away from him, 
so let us enter and gladden his heart by tasting of his hospitality. Perchance for our so doing, Allah may reunite me with my father. When the eunuch heard these words, he cried, A fine thing this, by Allah! Shall the sons of wazirs be seen eating in a common cook-shop? Indeed, I keep off the folk from thee with this quarter-staff, lest they even look upon thee, and I dare not suffer thee to enter this shop at all. When Hassan of Basura heard this speech, he marvelled, and turned to the eunuch with tears pouring down his cheeks, and Ajib said, Verily my heart loves him. But he answered, Leave this talk, thou shalt not go in. Thereupon the father turned to the eunuch and said, O worthy sir, why wilt thou not gladden my soul by entering my shop? O thou who art like a chestnut, dark without, but white of heart within! O thou of the like of whom a certain poet said! The eunuch burst out a laughing and asked, Said what? Speak out by Allah, and be quick about it. So Hassan the Basorite began reciting these couplets. If not master of manners, or aught but discreet, In the household of kings no trust could he take. And then for the harem, what eunuch is he, Whom angels would serve for his service's sake? The eunuch marvelled, and was pleased at these words. So he took Ajib by the hand, and went into the cook's shop, Whereupon Hassan the Basorite ladled into a saucer some conserve of pomegranate grains wonderfully good, dressed with almonds and sugar, saying, You have honoured me with your company. Eat then, and health and happiness to you. Thereupon Ajib said to his father, Sit thee down and eat with us, so perchance Allah may unite us with him we long for. Quoth Hassan, O my son, Hast thou then been afflicted in thy tender years with parting from those thou lovest? Quoth Ajib, Even so, O nuncle mine, my heart burns for the loss of a beloved one who is none other than my father, and indeed I come forth, I and my grandfather, to circle and search the world for him. Oh, the pity of it, and how I long to meet him! Then he wept with exceeding sorrow for his own bereavement, which recalled to him his long separation from dear friends and from his mother, and the eunuch was moved to pity for him. Then they ate together till they were satisfied, and Ajib and the slave rose and left the shop. Hereat Hassan the Basorite felt as though his soul had departed his body, and had gone with them, for he could not lose sight of the boy during the twinkling of an eye, albeit he knew not that Ajib was his son. So he locked up his shop, and hastened after them, and he walked so fast that he came up with them before they had gone out of the western gate. The eunuch turned and asked him, What ails thee? And Badr ad -Din answered, When ye went from me, meseemed my soul had gone with you, and as I had business without the city gate, I purposed to bear you company till my matter was ordered, and so return. The eunuch was angered, and said to Ajib, This is just what I feared. We ate that unlucky mouthful, which we are bound to respect, and here is the fellow following us from place to place, for the vulgar are ever the vulgar. Ajib, turning and seeing the cook just behind him, was wroth, and his face reddened with rage, and he said to the servant, Let him walk the highway of the Muslims, but when we turn off to our tents, and find that he still follows us, we will send him about his business with a flea in his ear. Then he bowed his head and walked on, the eunuch walking behind him. But Hassan of Basura followed them to the plain al Hassa, and as they drew near the tents, they turned round and saw him close on their heels. So Ajib was very angry, fearing that the eunuch might tell his grandfather what had happened. His indignation was the hotter for apprehension, lest any say that after he had entered a cook-shop, the cook had followed him. So he turned and looked at Hassan of Basura, and found his eyes fixed on his own, for the father had become a body without a soul, and it seemed to Ajib that his eye was a treacherous eye, or that he was some lewd fellow. So his rage redoubled, and stooping down he took up a stone weighing half a pound, and threw it at his father. It struck him on the forehead, cutting it open from eyebrow to eyebrow, and causing the blood to stream down, and Hassan fell to the ground in a swoon, whilst Ajib and the eunuch made for the tents. When the father came to himself, he wiped away the blood, and tore off a strip from his turband, and bound up his head, 
blaming himself the while, and saying, I wronged the lad by shutting up my shop and following, so that he thought I was some evil-minded fellow. Then he returned into his place, where he busied himself with the sale of his sweetmeats, and he yearned after his mother at Basura, and wept over her, and broke out repeating, Unjust it were to bid the world be just, and blame her not, she ne'er was made for justice. Take what she gives thee, leave all grief aside, for now to fair and then to foul her lust is. So Hassan of Basura set himself steadily to sell his sweetmeats, but the wazir his uncle halted in Damascus three days, and then marched upon Emesa, and passing through that town he made inquiry there, and at every place where he rested. Thence he fared on by way of Hama and Aleppo, and thence to Diyar Bakr, and Maridin, and Mosul, still inquiring till he arrived at Basura city. Here, as soon as he had secured a lodging, he presented himself before the Sultan, who entreated him with high honour, and the respect due to his rank, and asked the cause of his coming. The wazir acquainted him with his history, and told him that the minister Nur ad-Din was his brother, whereupon the Sultan exclaimed, Allah have mercy upon him, and added, My good Saib, he was my wazir for fifteen years, and I loved him exceedingly. Then he died, leaving a son who abode only a single month after his father's death, since which time he has disappeared, and we could gain no tidings of him. But his mother, who is the daughter of my former minister, is still among us. When the wazir Shams ad heard that his nephew's mother was alive and well, he rejoiced and said, O oh, king, I much desire to meet her. The king, on the instant, gave him leave to visit her, so he betook himself to the mansion of his brother Nur ad-Din, and cast sorrowful glances on all things in and around it, and kissed the threshold. Then he bethought him of his brother Nur ad-Din Ali, and how he had died in a strange land, far from kith and kin and friends. And he wept, and repeated these lines. I wander mid these walls, my Lila's walls, and kissing this and other wall I roam. Tis not the walls or roof my heart so loves, but those who in this house had made their home. Then he passed through the gate into a courtyard, and found a vaulted doorway, builded of hardest cyanite, inlaid with sundry kinds of multicoloured marble. Into this he walked and wandered about the house, and throwing many a glance around, saw the name of his brother, Nur ad-Din, written in gold wash upon the walls. So he went up to the inscription and kissed it, and wept and thought of how he had been separated from his brother, and had now lost him for ever, and he recited these couplets. I ask of you from every rising sun, and eke I ask when flasheth leaven light. When I pass my nights in passion pain, yet ne'er I plain me of my painful plight. My love, if longer last this parting throw, little by little shall it waste my sprite. And thou wouldst bless these eyne with sight of thee, One day on earth I crave none other sight. Think not another could possess my mind, Nor length nor breadth for other love I find. Then he walked on till he came to the apartment of his brother's widow, the mother of Badr ad-Din Hassan the Egyptian. Now, from the time of her son's disappearance, she had never ceased weeping and wailing through the light hours and the dark, and when the years grew longsome with her, she built for him a tomb of marble in the midst of the saloon, and there used to weep for him day and night, never sleeping save thereby. When the wazir drew near her apartment, he heard her voice, and stood behind the door while she addressed the sepulchre in verse, and said, Answer by Allah, sepulchre, are all his beauties gone? Hath changed the power to blight his charms, that beauty's paragon? Thou art not earth, O sepulchre, thou art not sky to me. How comes it then in thee I see conjoint the branch and moon? While she was bemoaning herself after this fashion, Behold, the wazir went into her and saluted her, and informed her that he was her husband's brother, and telling her all that had passed between them, laid open before her the whole story, how her son, Badr ad-Din Hassan, 
had spent a whole night with his daughter full ten years ago, but had disappeared in the morning. And he ended with saying, My daughter conceived by thy son, and bare a male child who is now with me, and he is thy son and thy son's son by my daughter. When she heard the tidings that her boy, Badr din was still alive, and saw her brother-in-law, she rose up to him, and threw herself at his feet, and kissed them, reciting these lines. Allah be good to him that gives glad tidings of thy steps. In very sooth for better news mine ears would never sue. Were he content with worn-out robe, upon his back I'd throw, a heart to pieces rent, and torn when heard the word adieu. Then the wazir sent for Ajib, and his grandmother stood up, and fell on his neck and wept. But Shams din said to her, This is no time for weeping. This is the time to get thee ready for travelling with us to the land of Egypt. Haply Allah will reunite me and thee with thy son and my nephew. Replied she, Hearkening and obedience, and rising at once, collected her baggage and treasures and her jewels, and equipped herself and her slave-girls for the march, whilst the wazir went to take his leave of the sultan of Bassorah, who sent by him presents and rarities for the soldan of Egypt. Then he set out at once upon his homeward march, and journeyed till he came to Damascus city, where he alighted in the usual place, and pitched tents, and said to his suite, We will halt a send night here to buy presents and rare things for the soldan. Now Ajib bethought him of the past, so he said to the eunuch, O like, I want a little diversion. Come, let us go down to the great bazaar of Damascus, and see what hath become of the cook whose sweetmeats we ate, and whose head we broke, for indeed he was kind to us, and we entreated him scurvily. The eunuch answered, Hearing is obeying. So they went forth from the tents, and the tie of blood drew Ajib towards his father, and forthwith they passed through the gateway, Bab al-Faradis height, and entered the city, and ceased not walking through the streets till they reached the cook-shop, where they found Hassan of Basura standing at the door. It was near the time of mid-afternoon prayer, and it so fortuned that he had just dressed a confection of pomegranate grains. When the twain drew near to him, and Ajib saw him, his heart yearned towards him, and noticing the scar of the blow, which time had darkened on his brow, he said to him, Peace be on thee, O man, know that my heart is with thee. But when Badr din looked upon his son, his vitals yearned, and his heart fluttered, and he hung his head earthwards, and sought to make his tongue give utterance to his words, but he could not. Then he raised his head humbly and suppliant-wise towards his boy, and repeated these couplets. I longed for my beloved, but when I saw his face, abashed I held my tongue, and stood with downcast eye, and hung my head in dread, and would have hid my love. But do whatso I would, hidden it would not lie. Volumes of plaints I had prepared, reproach and blame, but when we met, no single word remembered I. And then said he to them, Heal my broken heart, and eat of my sweetmeats, for by Allah I cannot look at thee, but my heart flutters. Indeed I should not have followed thee the other day, but that I was beside myself. By Allah, answered Ajib, thou dost indeed love us. We ate in thy house a mouthful when we were here before, and thou madest us repent of it, for that thou followedst us, and wouldst have disgraced us. So now we will not eat aught with thee, save on condition that thou make oath not to go out after us, nor dog us. Otherwise we will not visit thee again during our present stay, for we shall halt a week here, whilst my grandfather buys certain presents for the king. Quoth Hassan of Basura, I promise you this. So Ajib and the eunuch entered the shop, and his father set before them a saucer full of conserve of pomegranate grains said Ajib, Sit thee down and eat with us, so haply shall Allah dispel our sorrows. Hassan the Basorite was joyful, and sat down and ate with them, but his eyes kept gazing fixedly on Ajib's face, for his very heart and vitals clove to him, and at last the boy said to him, Did I not tell thee thou art a most noyous dotard? So do stint thy staring in my face. 
but when Hassan of Basura heard his son's words, he repeated these lines. Thou hast some art the hearts of men to clip, close-veiled, far-hidden mystery, dark and deep. O thou whose beauties sham the lustrous moon, wherewith the saffron morn fears rivalship. Thy beauty is a shrine shall ne'er decay, whose signs shall grow until they all outstrip. Must I be thirst-burnt by that Eden brow, and die of pine to taste that Kauzar lip? Hassan kept putting morsels into Ajib's mouth at one time, and at another time did the same by the eunuch, and they ate till they were satisfied, and could no more. Then all rose up, and the cook poured water on their hands, and loosing a silken waist-shawl, dried them, and sprinkled them with rose-water from a casting-bottle he had by him. Then he went out, and presently returned with a gugglet of sherbet, flavoured with rose-water, scented with musk, and cooled with snow, and he set this before them, saying, Complete your kindness to me. So Ajib took the gugglet and drank, and passed it to the eunuch and it went round till their stomachs were full, and they were surfeited with a meal larger than their want. Then they went away, and made haste in walking till they reached the tents, and Ajib went in to his grandmother, who kissed him, and thinking of her son, Badr din Hassan, groaned aloud, and wept, and recited these lines. I still had hoped to see thee, and enjoy thy sight, for in thine absence life has lost its kindly light, I swear my vitals, what none other love but thine, by Allah, who can read the secrets of the sprite? Then she asked Ajib, O my son, where hast thou been? And he answered, In Damascus city, whereupon she rose, and set before him a bit of scone and a saucer of conserve of pomegranate grains, which was too little sweetened. And she said to the eunuch, Sit down with thy master said the servant to himself, By Allah, we have no mind to eat. I cannot bear the smell of bread. But he sat down, and so did Ajib, though his stomach was full of what he had eaten already, and drunken. Nevertheless he took a bit of the bread, and dipped it in the pomegranate conserve, and made shift to eat it. But he found it too little sweetened, for he was cloyed and surfeited. So he said, Whoa, What be this wild beast stuff? Oh, my son, cried his grandmother, Dost thou find fault with my cookery? I cook this myself, and none can cook it as nicely as I can, save thy father, Badr din Hassan. By Allah, O my lady, Ajib answered, this dish is nasty stuff, for we saw but now in the city of Bassora a cook who so dresseth pomegranate grains that the very smell openeth a way to the heart, and the taste would make a full man long to eat. And as for this mess compared with his, "'Tis not worth either much or little. "'When his grandmother heard his words, "'she waxed wroth with exceeding wrath, "'and looked at the servant. "'And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, "'and ceased to say her permitted say.'" End of section 16